Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, ladies and gentlemen. We are here today for the second workshop of the series on data mining. And this is uh, being done by Dr. Pedro Campos from Portugal. Uh, I will uh, start by sharing my screen and uh, we'll hand over to him in a short while. So I'm sharing my screen right now. Um, are you able to see my screen, please? Yes. Okay, I'll do the slide so everybody needs to know that my computer, I don't know why it gets stuck when I do the slide show, but when I'm lucky, it doesn't get stuck. Sometimes, you know, when it gets stuck, I don't have even just have to escape this thing, but I have to leave the meeting and then rejoining it. So <laughs> let's try it and let's hope that this time it doesn't get stuck. Last time I was lucky. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Park Institute of Statistical Training and Research. And uh, we can see our mission and our vision we already showed. My name is Saleha. Um, and the focal person is Dr. Sayyid Vaseem Abbas, who is the General Secretary of Star, and very much here today. Mr. Muhammad Iftakhar is here. Dr. Sharka is about to join, Zulekha Kamal. Mr. Mo Professor Mohammad Aslam, Mr. Mohammad Javad, Dr. Harris Khurram, Ms. Aksabid. Uh, international participants, I again apologize if, I, if we are missing some people and maybe some are going to join in a very short while. Uh, the names are there. And now these are the national participants, uh, my own team, myself, and all these people on the left side. Uh, please, I would like to request people to mute their mics Last time, uh, the mic got unmuted for somebody, and then we had to edit. Please mute the mic. Uh, please mute the mic. And last time, you know, we had then had to edit it, and it was hours upon hours upon hours to get that one sentence out. Because, you know, when you do that, that is not time consuming, but later, uh, whatever the technicality is, it takes hours. So please, I would like to request everybody to keep their mic muted. Only allow mine and the resource person's mic to be on. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, the plan of the day. After a brief introduction, Dr. Pedro will start his presentation and also he will uh, hopefully, uh, I think he would like to allow people to practice. But Pedro, I want you to know that since we do not have two or three rooms, so it will have to be just this one virtual room and only one of us uh, at one time will be uh, doing whatever you will be asking him to do, the practice part, and the others will be watching. But we can obviously alternate, like one time it can be me, one time it can be Thomas, one time it can be Baliga and like that. So after that, uh, at 4 or 5, we will have the break for Asr prayer. And after that, we I will be announcing the uh, virtual conference and the post conference workshop that is being sponsored by a highly reputable, reputed organization, the International Association of S Survey Statisticians, which is under the umbrella of the ISI, the International Statistical Institute. And we are it, we're delighted that uh, you know, they are uh, sponsoring it. And we hope that every single one of you will be there. Um, after that, from 420 to 450, Pedro, you will have half an hour more to wind up whatever you were doing to, would have been done today. After that, at, uh, seven minutes I've put there for Q&A. Uh, I hope uh, maybe we don't need this session if everything is clear, but the feedback part is very important. And I would like you to, ladies and gentlemen, to please give verbal feedback as well. Uh, of course, if we don't have time, then we ask you to do it by writing in the chat. Words of appreciation will be given by Professor Muhammad Aslam, one of the senior most uh, members of the core team of Piastra. All right, now I proceed. So this is uh, an introduction of Dr. Pedro for those who are joining for the first time today. And I also want to welcome the country coordinators. I'm we are delighted that you have joined. At just uh, maybe one or two days notice. And for the co coordinator from uh, Nigeria, uh, whose name I'm uh, wanting to learn how to pronounce, I might Google it in a short file. 
um, you had only a few hours, just in the three, three, four hours you have joined. I mean, you didn't know anything about it. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Pedro Campos has a PhD in business and management studies and all the other things you can see. Um, he is assistant professor at the University of Porto, Faculty of Economics, teaching statistics and computer science. I think that's a wonderful combination for data science, isn't it? Additional current positions and roles. Deputy director of the ISLP, the International Statistical Literacy Project. Researcher at LIAAD, the Laboratory of Artificial Intelligence and Decision Support of INESCTEC, where he coordinates the research line of agent-based modeling. We must have that workshop. It was so exciting when I was there in Santa Fe, looking at this thing, agent-based modeling. His main, main research interests are data science, network mining, artificial intelligence, statistical education. Um, there's a long list of publications and I am not doing it today because we want to save time. He has uh, written uh, two books, he's given book chapters. He has uh, supervised uh, people who have defended their PhD theses and so many master's theses. And they are ongoing, all these people are under his supervision right now. And uh, so many projects that he has done. Next. Topic for today, ladies and gentlemen, data mining, modeling and evaluation. So the contents are machine learning, main supervised and unsupervised learning algorithms, clustering and decision slash regression trees, and then case studies and practice by us with software. Over to Dr. Pedro Campos, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to request you to take over. Thank yes. you, thank you very much. So hi and good morning again or good afternoon to everybody. Um, I, I don't know if I can start by asking for those who have been uh, attending uh, two weeks ago in the first workshop, if there is anything that maybe uh, different way of uh, introducing things that you want me, maybe you wanted me to do instead of uh, this way of um, of uh, introducing the the course. If not, I can uh, just continue like that. Can I say, Pedro, something in the start? Of can course, you thank just you. Uh, give the meaning of mining? What do you mean by mining? You did it last time also, but. Uh, just for people who are new and uh, because it, it's a new world, but everything is uh, as you do in other uh, fields, data science or data analysis or whatever. What exactly mining means? Can you Ma just- You, you mean data mining? Yeah, mining, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I think I, I, have, um, I, have, I have a slide in the last presentation more or less related to that. So mining uh, has to do with uh, exploring things, you know, when you do mining, for example, I think that the word mining in English is related to mining, uh, you know, the, the mines, the where from, from where you can extract gold or maybe silver or any other kind of mining. I think that's, that's the idea, that's the metaphor. So uh, you can use uh, this word to explore data. So I think that there is a kind of a parallel between data mining and mining any kind of matter you know so that's i don't know who invented this but i think it makes sense to explore data in the same way that you can explore for example uh, any kind of uh, raw material so data mining is um is this kind of thing uh, but i don't know if you uh, wanted maybe to also to approach another uh, i would say a topic which is the the, that data mining nowadays is sometimes being replaced by another word or the, another expression, another field of science, which is data science. Uh, in my perspective, data science is a kind of a big hat for everything, uh, including statistics, uh, data analysis, 
uh, and data mining as well. So maybe I, I, I had a, a, I showed a, a, a slide um, comparing the statistical approach and data mining approach. Maybe you remember. And uh, I know that your question is not is not about that, but of course that there are issues that. Uh, from the statistical point of view, uh, you, know, you need to make assumptions about the distributions of the data. You need to be aware of the sampling methods that you use to extract the data. And from this statistical point of view, these are things that you need to care about. From a data mining perspective, you don't. The most part of the cases don't just don't care about the assumptions, the most part of the assumptions of the data. So uh, in, in summary, um, these are different perspectives of data analysis or uh, if you can say data science. So to resume, data mining is one of these perspectives uh, in, my, in my, I don't know if you agree with me, but this is my opinion. Can I add something, sir? Of course, please. Well, uh, like in statistics, you know, we, we say that, you know, we, need, we, we can, translate data into information, information to knowledge, you know, using any set of data, right? So in data mining, actually the, the theme is same, but the data is large enough, you know, we use big data, you know, like the five Vs of the data, the variety, veracity, you know, volume, like this stuff. And in, in addition to, you know, like numeric data, we also look into text data, you know, like for example, we have to look into social media content like for example, audio and video data, right? So in data mining is much beyond in the, you know, statistical traditional tools of translating data into information, information to knowledge. So, I mean, this is a slight uh, addition I, I, I would like to make it. That's completely right. Uh, of course, uh, data mining is also related to uh, big data. So there are, of course, different perspectives uh, of, uh, from the statistical point of view, uh, statistics didn't approach or is not approaching. Uh, not This is not only the, the question of having uh, uh, assumptions to deal with, but also uh, the type of data that we deal with. Of course, uh, we call this complex data, for example, uh, social media, video, uh, streaming, uh, networks, uh, etc. Everything is complex. And so this is, of course, one of the things that we do in data mining is, as well, is to use this kind of complex data and big data, of course. Big data has to do not only with the, the variety of the data in terms of sources of the type or the type of data, but also it has to do with the volume of data, the volume and the velocity, as you said, there are three or four or five Vs that characterize the type of big data. And of course, big data is also something that we um, connect to data mining. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, just maybe to, to just to add one, one more topic to this discussion. Uh, in my perspective, the field of data mining uh, has grown up from the people that is uh, more connected to uh, um, um, computer science. So they came from engineering, uh, they come from computer science, for example. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the traditional, let, let me call it uh, like that, uh, statistics comes for, from people that have some uh, background in mathematics or uh, uh, and statistics itself. So I think that the two fields are converging in the in the goals. Uh, we are more or less trying to do the same thing, the same thing, but with the different approaches. And I think that data science is a good hat for everything, because what we do indeed is data science. Okay, so I'm I'm going to proceed. Uh, so uh, let me just say uh, another. Um, um, uh, I, I need to share my screen first, of course. <clears throat> Let me just say that uh, all the materials, as you know, uh, are in a particular folder. This one here that you can find in the slides. So of course, that you, you, if you don't type the, the right name, so I'm going to share it with you in the chat, okay. Sometimes when I click there, it does not go there. So I need to copy and paste this link and uh, paste it into a browser so that I can use it. 
So I'm going to do this uh, right now. So if I just copy and paste like that. So this is where uh, uh, I, I, I will arrive. I will arrive to this uh, folder. And uh, there are the slides in PDF of our last course of data preparation. Uh, and for example, I have a new version of these slides because maybe you remember some of you detected some uh, errors in my slides and then I changed I changed them. And remember one of them has had to do with the skewed distributions to the left or to the right. Okay, so of course it was wrong there. Now it is, it has been corrected. Um, okay. So if you just use the version two, it's there. Thank you so much. Okay, and also the slides for today, the course two, modeling and evaluation, uh, as well as the data sets that we are going to need. And of course we are going to, to need, uh, we are going to proceed with the, the churn, the, the one that we have used uh, two weeks ago. And this is the R code uh, for the, the, the workshop of today, this one here. So let me get back, go back to the, to the slides. So this is the, the PowerPoint presentation. So now for the workshop two. So these are, this is the folder where the materials. So um, yeah. Pedro, I would like to say that just like Dr. Virk asked you, what is meant by mining? Today, if you would first tell us what is meant by modeling. Okay, <laughs> great. So may maybe in the, in the, um, during the course, I think I, I'm going to, also to, to address this. So let me just uh, uh, maybe go to the, okay. Uh, let me just introduce the, the workshop and then uh, in the, so the sequence of the workshops. Okay. And uh, there is a particular slide that I would like to, to show you again, uh, which I think uh, that will uh, clarify these words, of course. So two weeks ago, because this, in this, uh, series of workshops to, of introduction to, to, to data mining, uh, there is a kind of a sequence. So last uh, two weeks ago, in the last, uh, in the first workshop, we focused on the data preparation step. So the data preparation step is indeed one of the steps of data mining, as I'm going to uh, show you in the, in the one of the next slides. Today, we are going to focus on modeling and evaluation. So modeling has to do with creating models in order to be able to do some data mining tasks. And what are these data mining tasks? These are the tasks, for example, of finding patterns in data or predicting uh, or classifying, for example. All of these are um, tasks in data mining. In for, for that purpose, we need models. And then why is the word evaluation? Is because not only we are going to use models, but we are also we also need to evaluate these models to see in so, what extent. Um, yeah. When you say for for doing these things, we need models, but still, then what is models? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe maybe I'm going to to go to that slide to that particular slide, which is I think I, I think that this is maybe the one of the most important, and then I will I will come back here. So in the, in the next workshop, we'll be dealing uh, with a particular type of data, uh, like our colleague said before. So one of the uh, uh, issues of the big data is uh, one of these Vs that characterize the big data is the V for variety. And variety stands for the different sources, dif different types of complex data. And for example, one of these types of complex data is networks. Networks is not a raw data as uh, you, you, cannot you can't just use uh, a, a table, for example, to, to uh, or a traditional table with, with, rows, with rows that characterize the individuals or columns that characterize the, the, um, the attributes to, to, to describe a network. So we need a different types of structure. So we are going to deal with that in the next workshop on February 20. Okay. So let me go to this particular slide. And this is, that's the slide, <laughs> the slide of crisp VM, okay. where everything is really, uh, um, uh, is, um, how can I say, uh, summarized in this circle, uh, 
so this CRISP is a cross industry standard process for data mining is a kind of a, a reference model for doing data mining. Where you start, where we have started in the first course in the business understanding, the data understanding until the data preparation step. So the, the, right. the first right. course was focused here, remember. Mm. And now yes. we are going to go to modeling and the, to do modeling and okay, and, and then evaluation, of course, because we need to evaluate. And of course, if the, the model won't work, you need to go back to business understanding because there is maybe something that you need to, uh, to be more accurate or to maybe to change, to find new variables, to create new features. So what is modeling indeed in this context? So modeling is something that you need to create in order to have an, a kind of an abstraction of, your, of, of something that you want to, to get. Let me go back now again to, to focus on this word modeling so modeling is one of the ways to or maybe the, the the way that you are going to follow to achieve these main tasks what are mm -hmm. the main tasks in data mining these are some of them pattern discovery association discovery classification clustering and forecasting of course these are only some of them and what is for example Pattern discovery is finding patterns in customer behavior, for example, in order to classify the customers of, as, for example, shoppers or shopaholics. Association discovery, for example, is to associate uh, uh, products that consumers usually combine. I don't know, uh, Saleh, if I'm, I'm answering to, to your question. Uh, it's, it's all right, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Please, uh, yeah? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So we are going to use models as a way of uh, uh, trying to solve these problems in data mining, the problems that we, that, that we have. Right. Imagine, for example, that you want to, uh, to know exactly, uh, to predict uh, if a new customer, according to his or her background, uh, is going to buy or not to buy a specific product. So this is a classification problem, for example. Right. And to do that, we need a model. Right. Um, so how many models and how, what are the models that we have? So we have algorithms. Maybe that's something that you were, you were asking and maybe I'm not going to the point. So to... It's all right. It's fine. You can okay. just do it your way. That's just perfectly fine. <laughs> okay. So uh, maybe it, during during the course, uh, I'm going to specify some uh, some important words in my perspective. One of them is 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 algorithm. So algorithm right. is kind of is the kind of an implementation of a model, uh, and these models are, for example, uh, uh, machine learning models. So modeling is indeed one of the steps in. Um, in the crisp dm okay let me go back one or two slides okay so uh we are going to focus on machine learning algorithms today uh and machine learning algorithms are usually divided in two different parts the supervised and the unsupervised so i, I don't know exactly how many of you are familiar with, with this i i guess that some of you are at least so please tell me if you are, if am i if i am bothering you with this with these words again uh, but the main difference um, between actually, I uh, I mean uh, the statistics people uh, for for us here in Pakistan, it's still relatively new. Okay. I mean uh, we we we've mm -hmm. heard these terms, we know a little bit about it, but uh, there's no harm whatsoever in your explaining it uh, okay, thank in you. full detail. I, I, I will do it, of course. Um, okay, so supervised models or supervised learning algorithms sometimes i confuse learning algorithms with models because sometimes it's not very easy to to distinguish the learning algorithm and in the model because you can use a model uh, you can use a machine learning algorithm to implement a model to do something when you call it supervised is that you have pre-classified examples basically you have a label so that's the idea you have a, a target variable already identified as as that, as, as, as a target variable. For example, in my last example that I was 
uh, introducing two minutes ago about this uh, customer, this new customer for which for who you, you wanted to know if he's going to buy or not to buy a specific product. So this variable, this attribute to buy or not to buy is what we call a label, is the target variable. You want to know something about this behavior. And this is a binary variable in this case, to buy or not to buy. But this is a label in the, in the sense of machine learning. So um, of course, machine learning algorithms, they learn with pre-existing uh, uh, examples, pre-existing uh, data. So you only can predict if this particular new customer is going to buy or not to buy a new product if you have information about other customers and other buying decisions for the same product. Of course, that's what we call this, the pre-classified examples. So we are going right. to predict or to classify based on others. Okay. Okay. So, and for this, for example, or, or what kind of um, tasks are we going to, to solve or to, to yeah, to, what kind of problems are we going to solve in data mining uh, using supervised machine learning algorithms? Let me go back again. For example, classification. Exact, exactly this one of classifying uh, new customers, a buying or not buying person for this particular product. Or uh, forecasting. Forecasting is also um, a, a supervised, uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is a data mining task for which you use supervising supervised machine learning algorithms. For example, how will sales evolve over the next two quarters? So what is going, what is going to be the value that you can predict for the, for example, the evolution of, of, the, of, the, of the sales in the next two quarters? So this, in this case, we call it the supervised algorithm for quantitative data, because you are going to, to predict a number, uh, a value, a specific value for the sale, not Yes or no, not a binary decision. But this is only a matter of, of, of words. Uh, we call this regression instead of calling classification. So uh, forecasting or regression uh, is, in this case, uh, more or less the same because you, you call this, this is a kind of a, a, a classification problem for quantitative variables. So all of this is uh, supervised. Okay, so models learn with pre classified examples. On the other hand, you have other types of machine learning algorithms. You have the unsupervised machine learning algorithms. So the unsupervised are all the situations, all the, all the alg algorithms that you apply not having pre-classified examples, not having a label. So that's that's the idea. It's ex okay. It is okay. exactly the opposite of supervised learning algorithms. Okay, uh, meaning that uh, the, the the thing doesn't have anything to rely on, whereas in the supervised one, it had something to you know. Yeah, like yeah. The, the words. That's right. Yes. The word supervised here means that you have, yeah, you have something to rely on in the in the sense okay. that you have a target okay. variable, that you call it of yes. course a, a dependent variable. So buy, yes. if, if a buying decision depends, for example, on, on your age, on your uh, uh, income, for example, uh, so these are explanatory variables that you can use as an in, uh, in a regression model to predict a particular variable. For example, regression models in statistics, they are supervised learning algorithms. You are going to predict something based on pre-classified examples. Right. Unsupervised, in unsupervised learning, you don't have this kind of pre-classified example. So the tasks are different. So what are the tasks that you are going to, uh, for which uh, you, you, you may need to use unsupervised learning algorithms? So for example, pattern discovery. You just find patterns without having pre-classified pre examples. For example, clustering. Clustering is exactly one typical uh, type of algorithms. Uh, when you, for example, want to do segmentation with uh, the customers in a, in a company, uh, just classify them in the, I don't know, um, group one or group two or group three, according to, I don't know, the money that they spend or the way that they behave or in an insurance, an insurance company, the ones that are more risky or less risky, I don't know, depends on what you are measuring. All, 
all of this is uh, clustering. And in clustering, you don't have pre-classified examples. So you can have, of course, target variables, but you don't use them as target variables. So this is unsupervised Pedro, learning. Pedro, can, can I, can yes, I, of can course. I just ask one thing? Thank you. Um, I am uh, uh, experienced as a person who do planned experiments, whatever they are. But uh, I, as I stood from your discussion today, when we have planned experiment, that means we decide, pre-decide on the variables. That's right. The factors which are entering into the experiment. And then we have some idea of the structure Completely. Uh, of the experiment. It's well planned experiment and you know the factors and what you want to get out of it. So that's a supervised thing. You are restricted of course. With, uh, with those things, with the treatments, whatever they are, which way they are to be organized in the design, how you the analysis will pursue it. But what you were saying in the mining, mining is an open field of data where you don't know what's happening in the data and then you get the data and then classify according to different patterns available within the data. So that is unsupervised because you are doing it mm -hmm. yourself rather than having something pre-planned in the data and how the data have been collected. That's what I understood. Is it right? Okay, for, for the first part, uh, I, I agree with you that, for example, if you apply in planning in, in planning uh, experiments, for example, analysis of variance or a, a model like this, uh, this is uh, for sure a supervised learning model. You have a dependent variable, usually a variable, for example, in ANOVA that uh, must follow a normal distribution, it, it must be normal uh, distributed, and it has some factors and some other independent variables. Usually the factors are uh, in ANOVA, as far as I know, they, they need to be uh, categorical variables uh, or something like that. And this is supervised because you have a target variable and this target variable is the variable that you want to measure. Okay, this is statistics, of course, but you can also use it in the sense of data mining. So I think that the data mining word here or the word mining has not to do with supervised or unsupervised. Please see the data, the, the word mining as a kind of a hat for everything else, an, an umbrella, you know, an umbrella for everything ha else. So uh, I agree with you that maybe mining seems to be uh, related with something that you are going to explore without knowing previously the, the target variables, but it's not the case. Data mining involves or includes these two types of algorithms, the supervised and the unsupervised. So I think that in truth, um, mining is also related to supervised in the sense that data mining, this, this umbrella for everything includes both types of perspectives. Thank but you. I agree with you that in the planning of experiments, the mine, uh, this is uh, supervised, of course. Okay, let's proceed. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let me just say that, uh, uh, Salaya, you just mentioned that I, I, I'm working in, the, yeah, and this is my one of my main fields of research, it's agent-based modeling. And in agent-based modeling, which is a different perspective, of course, you can also uh, use machine learning models. There is a typical learning model that does not fit <laughs> this uh, uh, binary classification of the, 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 the machine learning models. So it's not neither supervised nor unsupervised. Is a kind of a third types of uh, third oh, type of machine okay. learning. It's reinforcement learning. I don't know if you have heard about this. So I've, I've heard yeah. that. Um, so yeah, yeah, reinforcement learning is uh, well. It's using uh, psychology a lot. So it's this word comes from psychology. Is the way of learning by reinforcement. You just uh, want to uh, fit your actions by repeating, by reinforcing the previous actions by a reward or a penalty. Usually this kind of uh, learning is a different way of learning. Like, I, I need to say that because first, it's one of my fields of research and second, it's not there. So reinforcement learning, sometimes you cannot consider it a supervised nor an unsupervised type of learning. Okay. Is it, is it equal to iterations in the regression analysis when you have many iterations remake the model then have some assumption then you calculate something say say errors and then do readjust the model is a reinforcement is it is it same thing and i don't think it is the same thing because in regression 
uh, you are using a different, uh, um, how do we call it, uh, hypothesis, different, not hypothesis, you are different, uh, you are using dif different observations for independent and uh, dependent variables. And this comes from different, uh, well, from the data. Uh, usually, and now maybe this is more in the in the field of psychology. I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know uh, <laughs> exactly how to say this. But in reinforcement learning, we use this a lot. For example, for game theory in economics, you know, when you want to, for example, model the behavior of a person when he or she uh, deals with money in finance, for example, if it is a person more risky or less risky, it's a so if it is a person that's going to spend a lot of money or not, for example, this is only a, a, an example. So to model the behavior of a person, that's, that's one of the ways where we use uh, one of the applications of reinforcement learning. Uh, so reinforcement learning is used as a way of uh, uh, learning uh, from uh, from the, the the behavior of a particular person, so we don't get examples from outside, uh, from the outside, meaning that the outside is somebody else. In regression, usually what we do is that we take all the examples, uh, so not only ours but also other uh, people's examples. So I, I'm not sure if I gave you the right answer because this is a discussion sometimes I, um, that we have. I, I would like to say that I think we will have the, your next workshop series is on all those things. <laughs> and uh, the, to, to, to my colleagues, I need to say that we need to stop this here now because okay. you know it's a big world. And uh, okay. there's, right. there's all, it's, I mean, it's, the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. But you know, Pedro, you now have only one hour and 10 minutes before okay. the break. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yes, and I, I, I need to go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, but this is a field that I, I, I get passionate with this, you know, because learning, machine learning has to do with data mining, of course. So your first so question please, was about... Please uh, schedule in your next three months. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so let's focus on what we're going to do today. We don't, we are not going to have much time. I, I'd like to talk about everything. So the basically the data mining techniques uh, whether if they are supervised based on uh, uh, supervised learning machine learning algorithms or unsupervised learning machine learning algorithms, um, they have to they they they, um, they have as goals to uh, solve the problems uh, related to the previous tasks of uh, finding patterns or predicting or forecasting or classifying whatever. So, and for that purpose, we have the models, we have the algorithms. So the discussion about the models. So you have basically four, well, basically, uh, sometimes we used to say that in supervised learning, we have basically two types of models, the classification models, I'm sorry for the typos, would be double S classification uh, models or algorithms and regression algorithms. So classifications are for uh, variables uh, when the labels or the, the, the dependent variables are qualitative, like for example, binary decisions, yes or no, uh, for example. Right. So this is classification. You can have right. not binary, they, they can be uh, polynomial decisions like uh, A, B, C, D, for example, uh, so on and so forth. And regression, when the variables are quantitative, I mean, the, the, the dependent variables, the, the target variables, of course. So, and then you have, just to give you an example, plenty, I would say plenty of algorithms. These are some collections of them. For example, neural networks, Bayesian networks, decision trees, KNN, KNN stands for uh, K nearest neighbors, supported vector machines, uh, random forests, uh, well, so on and so forth. So these are all supervised learning models or algorithms if they are specified as algorithms, specific algorithms. And then you have unsupervised learning algorithms, for example, association rules or clustering. So today we are going to focus on these three, two, uh, models, uh, two supervised learning uh, algorithms like decision trees and KNN. And for unsupervised learning, we are going to focus on clustering. Okay, so now 
you know where we are in terms of uh, the crisp dm cycle so we uh, stopped on this step here in the last course now we are going to focus on modeling and evaluation and usually the deployment phase is very it's, it's something that depends on your context in terms of business so uh, it's, it's the adaptation is the implementation of your model in the business itself so we of course it's very difficult to talk about this without having a a, a real problem or a problem in, that we could uh, follow since the beginning to the end. Okay, so just before entering in these three algorithms, I need to introduce the word now, the word evaluating. So now that you know that models and algorithms, are, I'm going to confuse them a little bit. I'm going to use the, the either words, modeling, models or algorithms, although they are not exactly the same. Now I'm going to talk about evaluation. So what is the phase, this uh, step of evaluating in the CRISP-DM uh, uh, schema that I uh, presented before? So it has to do with how much confidence we have in the decision model. For example, we need to check what percentage of the decisions are right. So usually what we do when we do evaluation is this. We divide data into two parts. And this is general for everything. One part has to do, has to do with the building the decision model. We call this the training set. And another part is to test the model. And testing the model has to do with comparing the model predictions with the expert decisions. Experts meaning that the past data that you have, okay? So of course that, let me just say something, maybe I missed that part. This is only for supervised learning algorithms, of course. Uh, for the others, yeah. you, don't, you don't need this step of, you, you, you can evaluate, but using different methodologies. So only for the supervised algorithms, that's what we do. We compare the predictions, of course, and predictions, of course, uh, has to do with the, with the, with the supervised learning algorithms, with the past data, we call this the expert decisions. Why, okay. why, why, are, why do we call the past data experts decisions? Yeah, because um, for example, imagine that uh, one problem could be, for example, uh, credit decision. Uh, you, you, we work in a bank, for example. There is uh, someone that is asking for credit, you know. Uh, to to borrow money to this person and uh, the bank uh, needs to decide if uh, yes or no it's going to borrow money to this particular person so of course usually what we do in the banks as far as i know this is a human decision human based decision so we decide on experts who are the experts they are the people that work in the bank the decision makers so imagine now that you want to make a model an automatic model a machine learning model that can make the prediction about the decision. And sometimes that's what happens in most part of the banks for small amount of money. There are machine learning models that immediately decide if that person should be given credit uh, money alone, for example, or not. And uh, what the model is, uh, what the model makes uh, is uh, this kind of predictions, if yes or no, this person should be given a uh, uh, money loan, for example. Um, and then in order to evaluate the model, we need to compare the, these predictions with expert decisions. So we need to compare the machine learning predictions with the human-based decisions. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's that's the idea. So but how, I thought you said, I thought you said past data. Yeah, yeah, and past data is usually in banks, it's human-based decisions. Okay, okay. Of course, if, if we start now to do this in a, an automatic uh, manner, of course, in the future, all past data are not uh, experts. Uh, they are based also in, uh, in machine learning decisions. Yeah, but usually when we explain this, is that uh, we, are in this, in, in, we use the perspective that we want to, you to, to introduce a new machine learning model that will replace the human decisions by an automated uh, decision. That's that's the idea. That's why we call, usually sometimes we call the past data to uh, uh, the expert decisions. Okay. So there are different ways of uh, evaluating models. 
there are basically two uh, steps in the evaluation process. These are the sampling, uh, where you need to split the data between the training data and test data. And then you need metrics to compare the decisions uh, made by the models with the past data. And we have metrics for classification, I mean, when the dependent variable is qualitative and metrics for regression, uh, when the dependent variable is quantitative. So just to introduce very uh, quickly this, uh, some of these methods, for example, one of these methods is the holdout. This is the one that we are going to use today. So basically you split, the, so this is suitable for large data sets for such as in big data. You split usually using this uh, rate, two thirds, approximately 70%, of data is going to be for, for training data and the rest for test. So you don't touch this test data, you don't you only use the training data in, in, the, in the beginning and produce a model. So you use uh, one of these models, like for example, neural network or a decision tree and the building a model, you build a model uh, by using only the training data. But then you need to compare the result of the model with the previously existing data, what we call the expert data sometimes, and this is the test data. So by comparing, you see, by comparing the model training based on the training data with the test, we make a model evaluation. And for, okay. that, for, this, for this purpose, we need the metrics. We need to have some of these uh, statistical indicators. This is the holdout. Another slightly different uh, method is the cross-validation. This is maybe the mostly used. And this is mostly used with K equal to 10. So we have the data and then you have different folders, different data, small data sets. And we do training from some of them and then you do test in the other ones. So the, the idea is that you uh, uh, split the data set randomly into K groups and some, some of the groups are used as test and the rest are used as training. And then the model is trained on the training and then it's test on the test set, data sets. And then you can just, you know, that's what we call this cross-validation. You just do this in different parts for some of them, they are training and then they are going to be tested. Um, and then the process is repeated. So the main difference between this process and the, the previous one, the holdout, is that in holdout, it just split it once and in this cross validation repeat. So I, I, I have a table here that maybe explains what happens. Yeah, for example, you imagine that you split the data five times. So you use the, the test data in fold one in one of the subsets of data, we call it uh, folders uh, or folds. Uh, and then all the others are training. And then we use the metric to compare the, the training with the test. In the split two, you don't use the same fold. You use another different fold, for example, the fold two, and you do the same process. So you use different folds. So that's this is the cross-validation, maybe the mostly used uh, method for, um, for this uh, step of evaluation. Then you have bootstrap. Bootstrap is suitable for small samples. Uh, it's almost the same, but you do... Um, you don't make this cross-validation process. So it's a kind of a holdout, but repeat it with different, um, with not crossing the this process as before. And so um, what do you do? What do we do when the, in classification problems? So um, usually we, um, of course, we need to compare the result of the, of the classifier and the, the, par the performance of this classifier uh, based on the counts of the text examples that are correctly or incorrectly uh, classified. And that's the idea. Is the, that the idea is that you compare, as I said before many times, the, 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 the outputs of your model with the pre-existing data. Uh, of course, that the pre-existing data is already, is already labeled, is, is already classified, and then you compare the results to see in what extent your model is good. So for that purpose, sometimes, and for you know, classification problems, so again, when the dependent variable is qualitative, okay, we use a confusion matrix. So what, what is a confusion matrix? It's something that facilitates the visualization of the number of correct classifications and compares the, uh, the, the classifications of the model 
predicted by the model with the uh, predicting pre uh, with the existing classifications uh, in um, the data. Pedro, so um, yes? Pedro, I need to I need to know why it is called confusion matrix. I find this term very <laughs> interesting. This is, a, but... <laughs> this is a very good uh, question for which I don't have an answer. I, I, I asked this myself. Uh, honestly, I never Googled it, so I don't know exactly why is this confusion matrix. Maybe because it's a little bit confused, but I don't think it's a confused. Uh, it, it does not make any confusion. So this is a confusion matrix, for example, where you have a binary decision. I don't think this is confusing, but anyway, they call it confusing confusion matrix. And to be honest, I don't know why, <laughs> because this is very easy to understand. So for okay. example, you have two predicted decisions. Call it- If I can add something. Yes, of course. Maybe you know the answer. Well, uh, Peter, for you, it's quite simple, but for, you know, for initial uh, learners, this is quite complex. Like, you know, uh, it's the probability of uh, type first error and type two error, you know? Uh, at the same time, we say that it's a true false, true negative, false positive, false negative. So identification of these four terms, you know, in a, in a, in a two by two matrix is quite challenging, you know, sometimes. That's why this confusion arises, I believe. And I, I think I agree, yeah, of course, I agree with you. Uh, maybe sometimes it's very confusing in, even to myself. And that, that's maybe why they call it confusion matrix, yeah. So the, the, you have, for example, a binary decision. That's let's call it C plus and C uh, minus. So uh, this is the predicted outputs, and this is the true outputs that you use in your test data. Of course, the test data contains the the pre-existing data. So we call it the true data, and these are the data in these columns predicted by the the models. So whenever you make this uh, matrix, whenever you build this matrix, you can have a kind of a uh, of a crossing uh, of the values when, when, when you have this kind of um, uh, uh, cross, cross table uh, where you can classify the true positives, meaning that the, posit the, the values that have been correctly classified, I mean, they have been correctly predicted as positive examples because they have been predicted and as positives. And in fact, they are positives by history. So we call them the true, the true positives. In the same idea, you can have also the true negatives, but then you can have false positives and false negatives. Meaning, for example, that a false negative is uh, uh, one value that has been predicted as negative. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the, false the false positive, it has been correct, uh, predicted as, as a positive, but indeed it is a negative. So this is why we call it the false positive. In the same way, of course, in the same idea, you have the false negatives that are predicted as negatives, although they should be positives. So based on this, we can now compute some metrics. For example, one of the easiest way of, of measuring the error of a model is by, for example, computing, of course, the number of corrected uh, 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 instances uh, uh, in terms of the, they have been uh, cor correctly, uh, correctly classified. Um, uh, and one of the ways of doing this, for example, is by computing the number of summing up the number of false positives with the false negatives. Of course, that the false positives okay. and the false negatives, if, and if you divide it by the number of the total number. That, yeah, that's, right. this is the test data cardinality. Then, of course, you can compute the percentage of incorrectly classified examples. Okay, so right. basically, in the confusion matrix, you know, we have this right. diagonal. Diagonal is the diagonal of the true positives and true negatives. So, if you just ignore the diagonal and compute the other diagonal of the false positives and false negatives and sum these values here, and then divide the sum by all the rest, you will get the percentage of error. Okay. okay, so this is the error of the model in the binary classification. And based on this, for example, hey, can improve this. Uh, and uh, maybe these are also some words that you have been uh, hearing when we talk about data mining, for example, for measuring. So the, the, the basic one is the, the error, the error rate. But for example, we can also have the precision. Uh, we can call it also the accuracy. So the precision is, the, uh, is a measure computed by dividing the number of true positives by the number of true positives and the false positives. Basically, it measures the percentage of the correct uh, classifications of all, all examples assigned to that class. And we also have the recall. 
also known as uh, sensibility. This is a measure of completeness. So, and recall is, is, is different. So you just divide the true positives by the true positives and the false, ne uh, false negatives, the sum of this. And finally, sometimes, and this is my preferred one, we don't use, we use a kind of a harmonic mean. This is not a kind, this is exactly an harmonic mean of the two previous measures. We call it the F1 or just the F measure. Uh, which is, uh, you know, this is a harmonic uh, mean of the accuracy and the completeness. Okay, okay. Um, this is only for uh, um, classification. I mean, when the dependent variable is qualitative, but when the dependent variable is quantitative, when you have a regression problem, you, you cannot use a confusion matrix because the, the decision comes in, a, you know, with a value, like for example, 250 or 151.2 uh, so it's not um, it's not a, a, a qualitative output it's a number so for 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 numbers of course you cannot use confusion metrics you you need to use other kinds of measures like for example the mean square error the mean absolute error the square mean uh, um, well and there are many different uh, uh, ways of computing the errors. So for the basic ones, for example, we use some of them in, in traditional regression. We just compare, for example, for, uh, with the residuals. You remember when you uh, you are aware that, uh, for example, the right. uh, the residual is the difference between the the predicted of uh, the prediction of a of a variable of, of of a value of a value of a dependent variable and the exact one. The right. difference computed in the as, as a difference of a square or the square of the difference can give you what we call the mean square error. So these are basically uh, the value, the two uh, uh, used metrics for measuring the, 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 the regression error. And of course, for these measures, the lower the values, the better uh, the predictive capacity of the model. Finally, for evaluating the models, you also have the ROC analysis. So uh, the ROC, uh, ROC stands for the receiver operating characteristics. So this is also used in statistics. So basically, uh, this is a curve. Uh, you can compute a curve basically um, by displaying the information, comparing the probability of the false positives and the true positives. And of course, uh, you can see that this uh, line here, this uh, uh, line means that um, you don't have any difference between them, so it's 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 very bad. It's, as, as I would say that this is the worst situation. So uh, the most uh, high that you can go, uh, like in this blue uh, uh, line here, the blue curve, uh -huh. the the better right. the predictive capacity of the model. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now let's start with the first. Uh, <laughs> data mining or a model, or let's call it machine learning model. Maybe this is the, the easiest one, the, the KNN, the KNN is the K nearest neighbors, uh, is maybe the simplest of all data mining algorithms. Uh, it can be used for classification or regression, I mean, estimation or prediction based on the type of the dependent variable or target variable that you're using, respectively, if you're using a categorical variable or a numerical variable. Um, so the, uh, the basic idea of the KNN is that uh, you use uh, a test example compared to the examples that have been classified in the training. Um, uh, in Well, this is uh, what we call sometimes the lazy learner because there is no training phase. And also it does not there is there are no generalizations from the training example so i, I will explain this uh, further so basically uh, we are we are going to use something like the euclidean distance for quantitative attributes so you just compare the distance of your new um, data uh, or new points to the existing points for example by using this euclidean distance or then if your data is qualitative then you can use other types of distance like for example the the hamming distance, which could be zero if the, the point is the same or one if the points are different. They are different. So this is the, the algorithm for qualitative variables. So this is the classification version of the key and of the KNN. So given a point uh, X and you don't know the output now to be classified, you start by calculating the distance of that point to all points in the training set. 
you observe the k nearest neighbors. Each neighbor votes for a class, and then the most voted class is chosen. So then you choose that the point to be classified is going to be classified by the most voted class. If your data is not qualitative, so if you, uh, your variable, your, your target variable, sorry, is quantitative, you do something very similar, but instead of a voting system, you calculate the weighted average. So the idea of having this uh, Euclidean distance, of course, is only for uh, cases like this one here. One of the most important questions is how to choose K. And sometimes it's not very, very easy. So there are algorithms to choose K. We're not going, of course, to enter in detail with this. Sometimes we used to say that the most perfect value for K is five. Um, a very low value could be K uh, one or two, but sometimes it's also very, very noisy. Uh, and so we don't have a kind of a, um, um, procedure. There are different ways of studying this, but there is not not a right uh, uh, or a very fast answer to to this to this question. I think that this il illustration will uh, show you how the uh, how KNN -N works. So, for example, uh, if we try K uh, equal to five, you see you have. Uh, um, a problem with two categories, A and B. So let's call this is a binary problem. So you have a binary decision. Your data can be classified uh, in A or B. So this is the, the existing data. Okay. So your model uh, has already produced this. And now you have a new data point, this orange one here. Mm -hmm. So by applying the KNN algorithm, your point is going to be classified in one of these categories, A and B. And of course, on purpose, I put it here exactly in the middle of, of these two categories to be a little okay. bit more difficult to classify it. But as you can see, by computing, for example, this is a, a problem of uh, regression in this case in uh, uh, KNN for regression, meaning that uh, the target variable is a quantitative. So in this case, you need to compute the uh, Euclidean distance between the orange point and all the other points. Given that we have K, equal to five, it means that you are going to find the five nearest neighbors. So that's why the this but, algorithm uh, is called. Uh, Pedro, the yes. green one, the, the bottom one, green one yeah. uh, that you have encircled, yeah. it seems to me that it is not uh, closer than those blue ones. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe it is not. <laughs> this is, yeah, of course, this is only an illustration. But imagine that, for example, it was okay. because yeah, if you if you just compute it, maybe maybe it is. I'm, I'm not sure. So I, I'm not the author of this uh, figure here. It uh, it comes from this uh, website here. Uh, okay. Sometimes it's very different. It's very difficult to find the nearest, or visually to find what what, what is the nearest point. And for example, in this case. Uh, the among the five nearest neighbors, three of them are from the category the category A, and the only two of them are from the category B. So based on that, the new point, the new data point, is going to be classified in, into category A because it contains okay. more neighbors. So that's that's the idea of the K nearest neighbor. Okay. Right. What are the advantages and drawbacks? Um, just to finish this uh, KNN approach. So the, the models are indeed very simple to use and to interpret. Sometimes we have problems of you know, having a kind of a machine learning interpretabil interpretability. This is maybe one of the uh, current problems of, the, of artificial intelligence. So we don't have it in KNN, of course. This is very easy to interpret. Uh, but it has some drawbacks. Uh, sometimes, you know, um, it can be very uh, computationally intensive uh, if you have a high number of attributes. Uh, and of course, the, the K parameter is, can be also very complex to, 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 to determine. So just to give you some of the advantages and drawbacks of this very simple machine learning algorithm. Okay, so uh, how can we do this <laughs> by using, for example, R or uh, rapid minor? So um, I have the same example. I don't know if you want me to do this in uh, using R. I can I can do it. So everything is in your uh, resources. Yes, uh, um, please, please. Do. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to use R Studio. I think I have it open already. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So I need to copy this uh, data here, this uh, code here, and paste it in a new window. Okay. I can. I, I can. I could also follow the the R code that I shared with you. I think it is maybe somewhere here. But I'm going to follow these classes. Can you can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to run some of these instructions for for doing uh, for for performing Canon. You need this library class. So if you are familiar with R, and I think you are, most of you are, you know you need to install this package class. Then you run it. Okay. So maybe you remember that this churn data. I think I have it here. I'm, I don't know. No, I don't. Uh, churn had some uh, missing values that we uh, treated uh, last week, or you tried to, to do this. Um, but now we have another problem, is that um, CANN uh, can only deal with qualitative or quantitative attributes for computing the distances. So I'm going to only consider the quantitative attributes. In case you remember, this is H. And I think I think it is the value, uh, the amount of uh, of uh, spanning uh, in this problem. So I can show you the the file. Right. Okay. Um, well, by the way, I think I need to open. Of course, the I don't have the the file open here. I need to open. So I'm going to open it very quickly. Okay. This is the churn data. I used to open the data using this import data set. So now you can see the, the data, the data uh, of this example of this uh, churn data, data set. So okay. we have the gender, the age, the payment method, the churn, and the last transaction. So uh, I was saying that the age, you see here, the age and the last transaction, these are the two quantitative variables. We are going to okay. use them to predict the churn. You know, the churn is when you just leave the company. Uh, so you can okay. people are can be loyal or then they can leave the company they they may churn so in order to predict if your if your customer is going to leave your company you can use a model like this and right. as I, I was saying before we have a problem with this data set because it contains some missing values so the first thing that i'm going to do is to okay uh is first i'm going to consider only columns true four and five corresponding to the target variable and the quantitative attributes second so this, that's what i'm going to do now then i'm going to omit the missing values otherwise it, it won't run and now i'm going to uh, before making the you know the, the model itself i need to split the data between the training data set and the test data set so for that purpose, I'm going to use not the rule, the 70, 30, I'm going to use this one, for example, the 50%. So I'm going to just by randomly uh, select 50% of the data to be training data and all the rest to be test data. So that's what I'm doing here. For example, this is the test data that has been uh, chosen randomly. And I'm going to show you now the training data. So we have exactly the same number of observations in the two data sets. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. So let me go back to the code. Uh, OK. So now I'm going to use this function here, KNN, OK, to right. make the predictions. Oh. Mm -hmm. What happened? I think that I have already. OK, I know what happened. The package was not installed by some reason. I need to activate it. Now it is activated, so that's why it didn't run. OK. I think it's the use capital C. Oh. You are completely right. Thank you for that. So that's why it was not running. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it was with capital C. That's why it was not. It was not running. Thank you, Thomas. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to. Yeah. Okay. So and now I'm in the phase to compare the predictions 
of the, um, the training with the test data. So I'm going to run this uh, line 13. Let me show you because we don't have many too much space here. I'm going to type tab. And this is, I don't know if you have, if it is clear for you, but this is, um, this is the confusion matrix. Okay. So the confusion matrix now is uh, plotting, is displaying the predictions, which are in the rows with the true values. In this case, they are, they are in the columns. So these are the true positives. For example, there are 46 true positives and 232 true negatives. So these are the correctly uh, classified examples. The uncorrectly classified examples, which are many, as you can see, are these ones here. These are the true negatives, for example, and the true positives based on what you consider positive or, or negative. This, in this case, we are loyal and churn. These are the two uh, binary decisions. But now let's compute the accuracy, for example. Yeah. So, because, accuracy, um, yeah. I need the, something in percentage form. <laughs> of course. Uh, if you want to, to compute the, for example, the error rate. So the error rate is going to be, I'm going to use, do it by hand, 108 plus 64. They are the yes. incorrect, incorrect, incorrectly classified examples divided yes by the number of all the examples that are here, that are, I think there are 40, 450, but let me just. No, 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 nine. Uh, uh, Doesn't matter, I, we, we, I yeah. think they're, yeah. Uh, okay, so 38%, this is the error rate. So Which that means 62% uh, is the... That's right, 62%, that, that's okay, okay, yeah, the... the so 60, the first result, the first result that you've got, 61.77778, plus the, person, the lower result, 0 0.382222, is that going to be equal to one? I yeah, mean, in uh, this, yeah, in this case, the... No. the oh, no. yeah, it, yeah, that's oh. that's right because you know that's right because the accuracy is the sum of the diagonal of x, meaning that you are doing exactly the other way around. You are summing this with this one here. These are the correctly classified examples with all the rest. So the accuracy in this case it's exactly the. But we should not uh, shouldn't be calling this the accuracy. The accuracy is a little little different uh, measure. But I, I'm using a code that uh, was already using the word accuracy. But I, I prefer to call it the the percentage of correctly uh, classified examples. And this okay. percentage is almost sixty two percent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the percentage of incorrectly classified examples we also we also call this the error rate is the yes. is. Th almost 38% or it's yes. over 38%. So when you add them, it will be 100%. That's that's right, that's right. Now, based on this, you can also compute the other measures, like for example, the recall and the, the F measure, but I'm not going to use this here. I don't have the code for that. So, um, um, Pedro, yeah. now that we've got one result at least in front of us, now what is the our, our client for him or her? Uh, is this good or bad? To have 60, uh, yeah. Okay, this is the evaluation of all the model. So meaning that the model, um, the quality of the model is 62%. In my perspective, it is low quality. Uh, the models right. should have, you know, 80%, 90% of correctly classified examples, not, not 60%. So right. overall, I think that the model is not very good. But in terms of specific decisions, uh, for example, here, uh, we, I, I didn't, I didn't show you this, but um, previously this prefix, prefix dot KNN, this instruction, I'm going to show you the result. This will give you the results for the new examples to be classified. For example, the first client in the, imagine that this is a new client, based on uh, his or her age and based on his or her spending, is going to be classified as loyal. So okay. this is the predictions of the model based on the existing data. Okay. Okay. So, and this is the classification of all the clients. We have, I think, 450 overall here. 
because this is the, the for the new clients that we didn't use for training the data. So these are the test data. So basically we are consider them as new. They are going to be classified like that. Mm -hmm. And based on the their existing classifications, okay, for these ones, we just compute this tab, with, which is a tabulation between the previously classified data and uh, the, the data of the training uh, of, of the output of the model. For some of them, for example, the classification was correct. Uh, these are the positive cases, for example. These are, for them, 46 of them were correctly classified as churn. And... 232 words were correctly classified as loyal. Sometimes you can associate, I'm not going to do that, but you can associate uh, costs with this. For example, imagine that you are the owner of this company. Is it better for you to classify uh, a churn client when is not a churn client or is it the, the other way around? It's like, for example, in medicine, in health, you know, dealing with COVID. What is yeah. the what what is most most costly is uh, having a false positive or having a false negative have you have you already thought about that when you so say when you say when you say costly is it in terms of that person's uh, health or, or that's what? right and yeah the cost for the person's health and also the cost for the national health system for example if you classify it as a uh, positive even if that person is not positive in my perspective, this is not a problem. The problem people is the person is going to be treated, even if the person has not the disease. But right. imagine what happens if the person is a false negative. I right. think it's most costly for the national health system and for the person itself. The person goes back to uh, his place, his or her place, and is going to infect the others because he has it, she or he has been classified as negative. But in mm -hmm. truth. He or she is positive. So mm. based on the kind of business or the kind of problem that you are dealing with, sometimes you can associate costs with this classification. Mm. But but uh, it will depend on the nature of the problem. For some yeah, problems, false negative is bad. And for some other problems, false positive is bad. Of course. That's completely right. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Sometimes you can associate and, and just... Uh, have an impression of the, the problem that you have. So the, sometimes that's why sometimes having a notion of 62% of correctly classified examples is not enough. Sometimes it's also important to have a notion of the cost that the impact of this in your business, for example. Uh, Pedro, you yes. use 50% of the data for training just that's now. That's right. Yes. Uh, so 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 now my question is, if you make it 90%. Uh, this thing will improve the uh, i mean the accuracy will improve uh maybe i don't know it depends let's we can we can can give a try and see what happens yes. Yes. for example yeah but i'm having a problem here with that function so let let me use another example for example i have an example here of uh, iris data set because this uh, example here has been uh, designed uh, exactly for having the same amount of data. I have another example with the Iris data set. It's a data set of flowers. Uh, so I'm going to use exactly, yeah, but this is- Yeah, um, I am familiar with that one, petal length, petal width, sep sepal length, et cetera. Okay. Um, but that's me. I mean, many people might not be familiar. Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, Saleh, I, I, maybe I would prefer to give this example with different rates of uh, training and test in a rapid manner. C can I do it? Yes, yes, please. Okay, I think it's preferable. We so need to me... learn rapid minor also. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so maybe I, I will take the opportunity to go through the rapid minor now. So this is a rapid minor uh, welcome uh, page. So I'm going to cancel this here so rapid minor is basically uh this so you have uh, i think i have introduced in the, in the last course but I, I can do it again so you have operators that you can drag and drop like for example if you want to read a file you need to drag and drop an operator to read this particular file okay and then uh for example to do the pnn you have also you need also to do that so what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the instructions that I have here. 
Okay, so I have everything in the same. Uh, okay, so now the rapid minor can and model. So uh, this is very simple. So you can just uh, use um, uh, this here. So double click the read CSV to open the file. I'm going to find it now. <clears throat> So here it is. I'm going to use the churn with no missing values in this case, because I don't have the, it's more complicated to use rapid manner to, okay, it exists of course, but I have a version with no missing values. Right. Uh, I'm just importing <laughs> the data now. So there are things that I need to correct here. For example, gender is not polynomial, gender is uh, binomial. H is in integer, yeah, it's correct. Payment method is polynomial, it is correct. Churn is not polynomial, it is binomial. You only have two possibilities to be loyal or to churn. But um, yeah. is not binomial a special case of the polynomial? No, no, because uh, you don't have any other option just to be loyal or to churn. And here yeah. it's polynomial because you have credit card, check and cash. Okay. And now there is another thing that you need to do is to consider one of them uh, because KNN is a supervised learning algorithm. You have, need to consider this uh, one of the variables as the target variable. So you need to go here, for example, in this case, it is churn. So you need to change the role. Otherwise it won't work. You, know, you need to have one label. We call it label. So the target variable is the label. So let me do it again. So you need to go there to the variable churn. Oh, okay. You need to change the role like that. Okay. And it's a label. It's not an ID, it's not a weight, it's a label. Label means okay. the, the target variable. And then okay. the column becomes, you know, green. Meaning okay. that, okay, now you have a label. So just finished. Everything is, is correct. And now this is very simple, you just add if you don't know where it is, you just uh, write the word KNN. Uh, in the, now you can see that the KNN is uh, inside this uh, folder of modeling. I think it's more or less intuitive. Modeling, then it is in predictive uh, and then lazy learner. So you have this operator KNN, you just drag and drop it here. And now you need to- I connect. love this term. <laughs> I, I love this term, lazy, lazy learner. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because it's it's sometimes it's it's very well, it's very lazy. It takes some some sometimes some time to I'm sorry about my dog. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Petro, when you say lazy, when you say lazy, your dog becomes active, you know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> uh, and second, he's uh, he's active uh, at rapid minors. Yeah. Sorry? No, he was yeah. Not working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, th I think now he's, he's, he's liking the. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to, now that uh, you, you need to make all the, the links between the beginning until the end of everything. So sometimes I, I, I don't know where, where to link. So I need to follow the already existing examples. This is not very easy when you have more than one of these slots here. Let me see if this works. So now I need to uh, run and the, the, bot, the, the button to run is this one here. So let me run this. Oh, it says that there is no input. I think I, I thought that I've already informed. I'm going to do it again. Shown with no missing. Yeah, the data is there. So churn is going to be the variable with the label. I'm going to do it again. I don't know why it, why it didn't work. I think it's another problem. Um, it's binomial. And also this one here is binomial. And that's it. Okay, finish. Maybe this is something that I shouldn't consider. I think it's going to work now. Uh, this 
link should not be there and I'll, I have already deleted. Okay, now it worked. So after uh, running the model, now you see that you have, you know, the design. So you can go back to the design. Design is uh, where you place the, the operators and you do the design of your uh, procedure. And then you, the result, this is the, the results. So, uh, well, basically we don't have nothing here. It just say that it, it worked. But you can you can see nothing. So to have a, 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 a more clear notion of what we are doing, we need to do something uh, more uh, specific. For example, we are going to use this operator validation. So instead of running the KNN um, just like that, I'm going to delete this operator. So let me cut it and then do the validation. So validation, I have plenty of validation here. So uh, basically this is the validation. Uh, Pedro, if yes? please, can you explain what is the meaning of the word validation? Okay, v validation is exactly the same as evaluation. So we are going to evaluate the model. Okay. So I'm going to repeat the procedure as I have done in R, but now in the rapid manner. So the validation, uh, has the same, uh, you know, connotation, the same meaning as uh, evaluation. Okay, thank okay. you. So uh, you're welcome. So uh, let me do this here. Uh, this is not the. Um, this is not the one here. Uh, it should be this one here. Split validation. Sometimes it's not very easy, but. Okay, when you know, because there are many uh, operators with validation, um, but this is what we want to do here is to do the split validation. Now, you remember the holdout, uh, we are going to split between 70% uh, and 30%. And what I was saying before, uh, in this case, you can use the split ratio. This is easier than in R. For example, okay. for by default, it is 70%. You know, the two thirds mm -hmm. of uh, training uh, data and the one third for test. It's, but of course you can change this. Okay, so now okay. that's what I'm going to do here. And then, as I said, uh, as I'm saying here in the, in the slide, you need to double click here in the validation. And now you are going to insert, you know, uh, you are going to see the screen split in two parts, the training and the test in the testing. So that's what we are going to do have now. Okay, now you have the, the screen split in two parts, the training and the test. So now I'm going to look for the KNN algorithm. KNN. So here it is, KNN. Please repeat exactly how it is, as it is. So you need to link, you know, make this connection here and also this connection here, like like this, I'm going to do it now here and MOD to MOD. Well, there, there are no many uh, different options. So if you just uh, get an error, please try the other one. So it, it's, you, in, in, in you will find it. And now I'm going to apply the model. So applying the model is just exactly uh, when you uh, have a, a, a predictive result and you want to compare the, predict the prediction of the training uh, of this um, test data uh, with the real result. Uh, and that's the, what you are doing in this uh, operator, the apply model. So let me see where it is, apply model. Okay, so it's here. Just follow exactly the same thing. So apply model and then performance. So I need to connect this with this and this with this. And then I need a last operator, the performance. Okay, so performance, let me check for that performance. Okay. Here they are. Now you need to, to know, uh, so this is a binary classification. So maybe we can use this performance binary classific binomial classification. Okay. okay. And now you link this here like that and like that. Okay. So everything is done. Of, I think that sometimes for those that are more used to R, maybe R it can be more simple, but then when you uh, 
because this visual part, sometimes it's easier, but some, sometimes uh, it can be more uh, hard to, to, to perform if you are not used to, to rapid manner. So I'm going to go to the process again. And now we have this and I'm going to connect. Now I need to connect those, you see, those uh, links that are missing. And I think now I have exactly the same thing as in the figure. Okay, there are plenty of models. If you just Google uh, rapid manner models, you can find models for KNN, for validating, for decision trees, for clustering, for everything else. There are already existing models. But sometimes it, it, this is also intuitive. Uh, when you do validation, you need to do every time you need to do this training and testing. So it's it becomes intuitive when you start doing this. Okay, so everything is ready now. I'm going to run the model. Okay, didn't produce any error. And now you have the confusion matrix. Okay. Of course, the model is the same, but uh, you know the cases are uh, randomly chosen. So you don't have exactly the same percentage of error. Now we have 67% uh, of error. We, I think we had 68 in the previous one, yeah. Um, but of course you can change this. Let me go back to the design. And now to answer to Saleha question, your yes. question is what about if we change this to 90%, okay? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, now let me do this. Okay. Okay. Uh, indeed, the, it was 67%. Uh, now it is 66. <laughs> it did decrease oh. so much. Well, in, indeed, the, the accuracy decreased. So now we have less less uh, accuracy. Um, Why is that? Why is that? I would well, have thought that it should be more. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes it does not mean that when you have a bigger uh, part, a biggest, uh, a bigger part of the training uh, data set, that you can get more. Uh, uh, more accuracy. That's that's what it means. It means that maybe it depends on the examples that uh, randomly the 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 algorithm is going to choose. It's completely random, so it based it is based a lot on the on the types of examples. So uh, although this the is, this yeah. is excess of, excess of everything is bad. I'm sorry? I want to. Um, uh, he said of excess everything is bad of because everything we have, is. We have done so much, so much. <laughs> Uh, no, I have another point here, uh, Pedro. If uh, it is doing it randomly every time, so that means that even if you're, if you're putting zero point nine, uh, then it should be done many times, and then we can probably take of some course. kind of an yeah. average. Yeah, we, we we cannot conclude just based on the two runs. Of course, let, let, let yeah, me, that uh, was only one run. Yeah, yeah. let me put a, a zero point eight here, and run it again. No, I mean that same. for I mean that for point nine we should do it a okay. large number of times oh, okay. and then okay. we should get an average. So isn't it's, that it's... already been uh, established that this should be like that? I mean, uh, no, of course, yeah, is... yeah. Is, it should be repeated. Yeah, you, you, of course, you should be, do this again and again and have an average of the error rate at the end, not just run it once. Yes. Of course, that you are completely yes. right. That you, 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 you are right, yeah. Um, there is another thing that I haven't done here and I should have. Uh, it's in the performance. Yeah, in the performance uh, operator, you can um, choose many uh, different measures. For example, even the rock curve, it's somewhere there. Uh, the precision, you remember the precision, the recall, uh, the F measure. Mm -hmm. Okay, the F measure is here. So you can do all of this. So the classification error, this is error rate, of course, this is the opposite of the uh, correctly uh, percentage of correctly classified examples. This is the, the curve. You need to take a look at the red one, not the blue one. So the red one is increasing like that. So it's not uh, as it should be. So this is good when you want to compare different models. Now you only have one model, but 
anyway, you can just see that this is the, you know, the diagonal is here. So it's not pretty uh, good. Uh, Pedro, I'm not yes. clear about this uh, uh, diagram. Can you please explain? Okay, so this is the rock cu curve. So this is the receiver operating characteristic where you are plotting the false positives uh, let me show it again here in the in the slide. I think it's better to show it again. Okay, so this is the the rock analysis is showing you the the false positives, plotting the false false positives on the x uh, axis, on the horizontal axis, and on the vertical y axis you have the true positives. So, but uh, the what you got, you got one going upward and one going downward. No, the, the, yeah, these are complementary curves. This is only one. You, the the one that okay. I'm showing is the the red one. So the, okay. the red one is this one here. The other is uh, based on a different measure. It's not the same thing. When you okay. want to plot, uh, yeah, the, the the positives against the the the, the true the, the the false positives okay. against the true okay. positives. This is the red one. So and, uh, if I if I if I want to judge this thing, I just uh, thank you for showing that slide again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this thing should have been more uh, up uh, more on up. The, That's top, right. the top top left corner. Okay. Yeah, meaning that you have more. Yeah, yes. meaning that uh, the the cases are being more correctly uh, correctly classified. And also one of the good things in this curve is that you uh, can use it to compare different models. So just by looking to one model. It does not contain right. you know enough information for you to decide so what i'm going right. to do next uh is to use this for example by comparing this uh algorithm with um with decision trees so i don't know how much time we still have before that uh we uh, have uh, 10 10 minutes okay so maybe i can start with decision trees and then stop and see what what happens can, can, can i do it yes yes okay sure. So decision trees. Even, is another... uh, even if even if you have five minutes more, no problem. Okay, thank you. So let me. So I, I'm going to introduce decision trees and then uh, stop and go to rapid manner even before going to R, just to show what how we can compare to different rock curves. One for decision trees and another one for KNN. So decision trees is also a classification. Uh, is also used for classification problems as well as KNN. So I mean that dependent variable is qualitative, um, but the algorithm itself is, well, it's completely different. Uh, this is based on a search algorithm uh, and the, the, this search algorithm is going to produce a, a tree. That's, that's what we call the decision tree. Uh, and this decision tree is based on the training set, okay? Um, this is very good because one of the good things of decision trees is that the, you can look at the output and, uh, this is very good uh, to for uh, you know to, to have a model that is interpretable, meaning that you can understand what the model is giving to you, and it, this is very good to to describe your 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 output. It can also be used either for classification or regression, depending of course on the type of dependent variable that you have. Uh, we used to say that if you have a qualitative target variable, we have classification tree. Also, we can call it decision tree sometimes. And when we have a quantitative variable, we have a regression tree. Okay, um, mm -hmm. so basically this is an example of a decision tree where you have a, a binary uh, decision. It can be, well, of course, cannot be, can be, uh, can have three levels, not, not, not only two and have a kind of a polynomial uh, decision uh, variable, target variable. Uh, for example, here you have a polynomial one. Like, for example, having good, excellent, or very good, or even bad decision, like this is a kind of an output. And the outputs are in the leaf nodes. So you have a tree. Usually you have a, a root where, where, the, where, where the tree uh, starts. And then we have the branches corresponding to variables, to the independent or explanatory variables of your model, until reaching a leaf node. And the leaf node corresponds to a decision. So how does this work? So you have um, an algorithm that basically chooses the order of the attributes. So this is very important for because sometimes even if you have, if you have a data set with let's say uh, 10 or 20 or even 100 different attributes, 
the decision tree can use only some of them, not only not use all the attributes uh, in your data set. Um, then for the binary attributes, for example, yes or no, the division of the attributes is natural, uh, ben, but when you have quantitative attributes, sometimes you need to have a split and this split is based on entropy measures that the decision tree algorithms uh, uses. Um, then you go and repeat the procedure until having the, the leaf nodes, which are the decision, the final decision that can be pure leaves, uh, meaning that all the, um, the cases are classified as in that class or not pure if you have a mixture between uh, classifications, of course. Um, so let me give you an example, a uh, little bit theoretical, but uh, you have data here. So you have A and B. So these are the two attributes. And you have four instances, four uh, examples or four observations. So you are going to start with attribute A. Okay. And uh, if you see, for example, how many, uh, so you can split the decision between zero and one because the A the attribute A has values of zero and one. So for zero, now you can see that um, all the values of zero for A, you have two values of A that are zero. You can see them here. And uh, two, uh, and there is no, um, and for all of them that are zero in A, you don't have any, any one, okay? And for the uh, values of A that are one, for example, these ones here, for B, one of them is zero and the other one is one. So that's why you have zero equal to one and e one equal to one. So this is the other attribute, this is attribute B. Okay, so now I'm using the, the right information, so I, I'm replacing that information by B, so depending on, on B. So this is a very easy, I think this is very easy to understand. So what, what I'm doing here is I'm just representing what is in this uh, conjunction um, uh, matrix. Um, and uh, of course, now that uh, if A equals to one, you have B. So when A equals to one, you have B. B can be zero or B can be one as you have here. And when B is zero, A, or the conjunction is going to be zero, as you can see. Uh, and when B is one, so when both are one, the output is going to be one. So I'm going to use this information now. And this is an example of a decision tree in this case. But this is a very simple example just to, to to mention how we could do this by hand, but of course, uh, this is not going to be like that because this is not so deterministic. So what we're going to use here are uh, what we call the recursive partitioning algorithms, um, uh, where the, the data, the, the, the data and the, and the tree uh, are going to be created uh, by splitting the, the data into the subsets. Uh, and the subsets themselves are going to be split into smaller subsets, depending on the data itself, of course. Um, and this is a very important point, is that the choice of the attribute for the root node uh, is going to be based on different kinds of measures uh, in order to obtain the best split. So sometimes we use entropy uh, measures um, in trying to uh, minimize the errors. And we have a splitting criteria, uh, I'm sorry, we have a stopping criteria to, to, to reach the end of this splitting based on this stopping criteria. Uh, sometimes this uh, splitting cri stopping criteria is based on, the, on the having only one value of the target value of the target variable. So it makes no sense to have in one of these subsets only one uh, value of the target variable. Okay, so how many algorithms do we have for decision trees? So decision trees are kind of a, of a model, but uh, with different implementations. One of the most famous implementation is the C4.5 or even C5 um, by Queensland. Um, so uh, it 
can work very well for categorical target variables. Uh, you have an information gain metric and multiple divisions. The implementation, the implementation that we have in, in, in R uh, and also in rapid minor is this one here. Um, all, although you can find other implementations of course as well, of course as well uh, either in R and rapid minor. Uh, so CART has been developed by Bryman. Uh, CART stands for classification and regression trees. Uh, also, it works for categorical and continuous target variables. You have uh, also some uh, metrics for Gini impurity in case of categorical or reduction of variance in case of continuous metrics. You have the binary splits. So, um, so at the end, you are going to have a tree. Uh, and sometimes you have large trees uh, with small leaves or small trees with large leaves. Uh, it can have some problems with that, but you have a solution. I'm not going to enter in detail with that with with these kind of solutions. Maybe you you, you have heard some of the solutions. One of the solutions for decision trees, where you have, for example, large trees with small leaves, is uh, uh, having an alternative algorithm that is a random forest algorithm, uh, which works exactly by repeating the the process of split splitting the the the, the making of the decision tree repeatedly so that sometimes you can optimize this decision tree or you can have pruning, you know? Pruning is uh, um, uh, just by, uh, like we do in the forests uh, or in the, the trees, you can prune the tree, meaning that you are going to reduce the number of the, the leaves. Um, so this is another solution for decision tree. So I'm not going to enter in, the, in, in details with this. We don't have time for that. One of the good things of decision trees, as I said before, is the interpretability of the models. So it is basically you can find some rules. So the decisions that you can take can be described by rules. Uh, and these rules are basically the relationships between the independent variables and the target variable. So as I said, we only have a few minutes and I'm going to go to the, uh, to the rapid minor. Um, so this is an, an example of what we uh, supposed to get today. Uh, let me do this. Um, so I'm in rapid minor now. I'm going to open a new process. You can maybe save the previous one if you want. I'm going to, I'm not going to save the, the previous one. I'm going to start with a blank. Okay, uh, again, I'm going to use this uh, read. CSV, okay, and then double click in the read CSV to specify the file that I'm going to use. I need to do this every time I need to. So I'm going to use this uh, churn with no missing. I think I didn't, uh, um, put this file into the material. So I need to, I, I, I cannot forget to do that uh, during maybe, maybe during the break. So okay. let me do this again, change the type to binomial here, change the type to binomial here again, and also change the role of this variable to be a label. Okay, that's it. So the operator is ready. So sometimes when you see the, the danger, you know, the danger uh, symbol, mean, it means that the operator is not ready to run. Now it's ready to run. And now I'm going to pick up the decision tree operator. So here it is. So just for you to see it inside modeling, predictive and tree. So I would say this is more or less intuitive. Okay. Just connect this one here. I think it's going to be like that. In the, the, the parameters that you can configure, for example, sometimes for the trees not be too long, you can just uh, define the maximal depth. I'm not going to uh, use this for now. Just click on run. So now we have a decision tree. Well, <laughs> by the way, this is a very big one. So what we are doing here, so this is a problem of having sometimes, so that's why we need to 
So this model, as you can see, uh, the idea is to predict, how, yes? How many observations were there? I think I... there are um, 1,000, almost 1,000 okay. observations, 1996, I think, in the churn okay. data set. So basically it says that the gender is maybe the most important attribute because it's the first one to be uh, to split the data between female and uh, male. And, and, and then for the males, you, you see you have last transaction. So all of this is made by the model. I, I don't have any kind of interference here. I, I don't, it's not up to me to choose the, the attributes that are used in the, in, the, in, the, in the rules, the splitting rules and also the values of the splitting rules. What is important to see is that at the end, you have the leaf nodes corresponding to the decisions. Well, but this is very diff difficult to, to understand because as you can see, what we got is a very, very large tree. And the very large trees is a, one of the problems. It's, they are very difficult to interpret. So that's why mm -hmm. we need to do the pruning, you know? I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back to the design mode. And now I'm going to impose a maximal depth. I'm going to apply pruning and say that, for example, I cannot have more than, for example, um, uh, five branches okay. in, the, in the algorithm. Let me repeat it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now, uh, of course, the, that the accuracy can be different. Now, you are not as accurate as you were uh, uh, before. We, well, we didn't discuss the accuracy so far in this kind of decision trees, but- But at uh, least you can under, understand. That, that's that. right. I, I can, at least I can have something that I can see and, and well, for example, now it's easier to interpret. For example, for example, this, this uh, case here, the churn or the loyal, what does this mean here? It means that, for example, if a person is a female aged after uh, uh, with an age uh, 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 older than 89 years and half, all the people are loyal in this case. Loyal, meaning okay. that you, you have a, a blue line, you see? Blues are loyal and the reds are the churns. On the other hand, if the people are female aged uh, 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 younger than 89.5, and for this, for those who are aged a little uh, older than 30.5, well, the most part are churn. Very uh, interesting. I, I, yeah. <laughs> and for the others, uh, younger than 30.5, based on the last transaction, now you need another attribute, based on the last transaction. If last transaction is, let me split this uh, for you, for it is easier to see. If last transaction is uh, 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 bigger than this number here, is uh, the, the amount is larger than this uh, number here, all the people churn, otherwise, other, uh, otherwise they are mostly loyal. So this is how we can interpret the tree. So it, this is very, very easy to see. And it helps you like in the regression model to see what are the most important attributes and also how these attributes rel relate to, to, the, uh, to the other attributes, like in a regression model. So you can kind of predict if you have a new customer based on their gender, their last transaction and their age, you can kind of predict if, it, if he or she is going to be a loyal or, of, or uh, if she or he is going to, to churn. Okay. Very For example, if they are male based on the last transaction, all the males are not all, but most part of the males for which the last transaction was above 120, they were loyal. So this is very good, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you see? So this right. is what we got for a, a okay. decision tree. This is the model. Pedro, we can do this Pedro, exactly uh, the seminar, yeah. I just need to tell you that now we need to have the break. Okay, right, of course. Or if you want to say anything here more then no I, I, I was just going okay. to say that after the break uh, i'm going to start exactly on this point and i'm going to do the model uh with the uh, with the evaluation part so we are going to evaluate the model and together with the knn we are going to compare the performance of the decision tree and the knn using rapid miner okay thank you very much uh ladies and gentlemen on my laptop it is 412 so let us please be back here by 420 or 421 or at the most 422. Thank you very much. Thank you. Trying to share the screen.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are continuing after the break. I'm wanting to uh, start uh, sharing my screen, but I'm uh, getting a bit confused. Okay, now I got it. Um, are you able to see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, we, we are. Okay, okay, all right. Yes, so I would like to take a I would like to take a few minutes to talk about this uh, conference that uh, I and my team, the Pi Star team, are going to uh, organize. This is a day long virtual conference on the theory and practice of uh, surveys and censuses. And after that, on the thirteenth of March, we have the online post conference workshop on the utilization of remote sensing in surveys and censuses. So this is a glimpse of the flyer and uh, anybody who needs it, please write it in the chat and give me your uh, WhatsApp number or your email address so we can send it to you. So this is being sponsored, as I said earlier also, by the International Association of Survey Statisticians. Uh, and after that, uh, you have a glimpse of some of the people who are going to be uh, the invited speakers. Uh, I'm delighted to share with you that Dr. Pedro has uh, agreed to uh, also give an invited talk. Thank you very much for that. I'll be, that would be great. And uh, then of course we have uh, all these contributed papers. So I would like to encourage all of you to please give a few papers. Uh, I mean, depending on how whether it's your area or not. But if uh, if if you are, uh, I think that even if you have analyzed uh, as a, I mean, you've supervised maybe a MPhil student or um, even a bachelor student, and she or he has analyzed some data taken from a from an actual survey conducted by for example, the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics or any other bureau in any country of the world, I suppose that could also be included. Because you see, if, uh, I mean, if you do some proper sampling and you collect the data, you also have to analyze the data. So that also gets related to it. Uh, I want to particularly talk about these uh, awards. We have uh, uh, introduced uh, these two types of, uh, I mean, incentives like uh, the best paper will be uh, awarded a cash prize of 200 euro and the runner up 150 euro. And of course, we will have a team of independent judges who will be evaluating them independently. And uh, then we all have the best poster prize and the posters in Pakistan, we think that it's only the students who create posters, that's not the case. Uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, professional people are also creating posters and presenting in conferences. And we have a uh, hundred euro for the first position and 75 euro for the uh, second position. Uh, the journal publication, uh, the Islamic Country Society of Statistical Sciences, ISOS, uh, they publish the, um, I mean, they are, these journals are linked with ISOS, the Pakistan Journal of Statistics and the Journal of ISOS. So uh, in the Pakistan Journal of Statistics, it has to be theoretical method methodological, I mean, theoretical uh, paper, but in the Journal of ISOS, it can be applications also. So depending on the nature of the uh, paper, uh, we will be inviting the best, best submissions to uh, submit their papers to these journals. Since these are our own journals, therefore the probability of their being selected is should be pretty good. But of course they will have their own pro procedure will be followed, the review process and all that. Uh, I also want to talk about this online workshop. Uh, it is going to be rendered by these four resource persons who will who are working and uh, uh, at the um, remote, the center of remote sensing at the University of the Punjab right here in Lahore, Pakistan. And uh, this, especially talking about the uh, application of remote sensing in surveys and censuses. So the fee is, uh, the registration fee is very, very 
uh, nominal, I should say, because one of the objectives of the IASS was that this should be, uh, uh, you know, people who generally don't have access to such information, such knowledge, they be given that access. So it, I think that means mostly the developing countries. And uh, therefore we have put, uh, we have not made it nil because we think that uh, it, should, it should not be nil. You know, sometimes if the fee is nil, people take, take things for granted, but it's a very nominal amount. And I would like to encourage you to please disseminate this information far and wide. And the greater number we have, the better. So thank you very much for listening to this. Uh, either please write your email addresses or your WhatsApp numbers in, the, in this chat, or please send them to Dr. Basim. The number is right here. Maybe you all can take a screenshot quickly and, uh, and do this. So now we are going to get back to the workshop. And uh, uh, just to remind everybody, we are talking about modeling and evaluation today. And we have already learned quite a lot from Pedro regarding machine learning, supervised and unsupervised learning, clustering and decision trees, et cetera. So now back to, over to Pedro. Uh, I'm going to now stop sharing my screen and Pedro, please go ahead and share your screen if you want to. Thank you. Thank you, Salah, again. Um, so we are, we have more or less one hour until, no, less than that, 45 minutes, I think, or maybe less, yes. I don't know, uh, maybe uh, half an hour. You, uh, <laughs> uh, well, wait, how much do you think 40 minutes is okay for you? I, th I think I maybe we don't need the 45 minutes, okay. uh, maybe a little bit less than 35, that. 35, maybe 35 okay. should be all right. Okay. Okay, good. So uh, let, let me just start by asking you if uh, there is anything that you maybe want me to focus more on or just to repeat or shall I proceed? I think it will be good if you proceed and we will have, I hope, very, I'm very optimistic that we will have another session uh, next week in which people will be practicing what you did. Just like last time we had one and that went very well. So at this time, I think you can go further. And if there are some queries, we might uh, I might uh, email them to you. Uh, the queries which will come out during the CLI session that okay. we might have Good. next week. Right. So maybe remember just to, to summarize, uh, uh, I introduced the, the models, some of the models that we are using. We start by KNN, KNN and then followed by uh, decision trees. All of them are supervised learning algorithms. So we need to have a target variable in advance. Uh, we are using in this example, the churn, which is a binary variable, uh, whether that uh, defines whether the client is loyal or uh, is not loyal to the company. And then I showed uh, uh, how it works uh, in R and also in Rapid Miner. So in Rapid Miner, uh, we have uh, seen the example of decision trees, but not in R. So um, I'm not going to run R now, but just for you to see the code, uh, you need um, this library here, R part, um, based on that uh, type of uh, recursive partitioning. So R part stands for recursive partitioning algorithm of Brynan, Ryman. And then I am also running uh, another uh, library, rpart.plot, which is very good for plotting the you know, the tree. Um, and this is the comment for emitting the, the missing values. Uh, and then, well, the comment is very simple in R. It's just uh, R part. Uh, then you need to um, describe the variable, the dependent variable churn, and then the, this uh, symbol here standing for the you know the dependent variable depending on the, all the other variables. Uh, that's what we do here, and then we, we just plot. So this is the, the result that you get when you run this model like that. Um, it's, it's good because um, you can see that... Um, so uh, remember that uh, one, one of the things that uh, I've said before is that uh, it's good that these models are very interpretable, the, the decision tree models. You have the rules 
and you can also have a, a picture of a tree. Um, the rules are not very easy to, to define in rapid minor, but very easy in R. So uh, for example, these are the rules in R. So you can see these as rules. This is something that you get uh, instantaneously when you run a model, you can just uh, see the output and the output is, is, is the rules. For example, here you can see that uh, if the gender is female, and these are the number of persons in the model that are female, these are the number of persons <clears throat> that churn. This is a percentage of churn, the percentage of don't, uh, those don't, don't churn. And then uh, this is a, this, the, the, the row number two means um, is divided into four, four and five, meaning that this is a branch. You see the gender, as you can see in the, in the picture, it's not very clear, but if you go to gender is female, female is here in your left-hand side. So gender is female is yes, then churn, you see. And then you have another split based on age. If age is greater than 30.5, then churn will be the, the most part of the cases, corresponds to the most part of the cases. Otherwise, they are loyal. So as you can see, if the age is over 31, and uh, if it is yes, you must go to the left, the most probable uh, um, decision is going to be churn. Otherwise, it's going to be loyal, as you can see. But if it is loyal, it can be divided again based on the payment method. So if people are above or below 30.5 years uh, old, um, corresponding to the most part of them that are loyal, uh, then uh, the decision is based on the payment method. If the payment method is cash or check, so it means that the most part are going to churn <laughs> in the future. Uh, otherwise, if it is a credit card, they are going to be loyal. So. Uh, Summing up, so uh, what what is important to to have uh, to 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 see in these kind of rules because these are rules, is that uh, all of these are describing uh, uh, actions uh, of being ch uh, churning or being loyal based on the, the, the explanatory variables. So you can take the path from the root until the leaves, but only one you reach. A leaf node is one is uh, when you get the decision, the final decision. So in this case, the leaves are uh, how many leaves are we uh, do we have here? Four. One, two, three, four. The, so this is the final decisions that you can have, and this corresponds more or less to the stars. You see the stars here in the in the in the rules. One star here means the this is the row number four, that corresponds to this case here. Uh, yeah, this is the one of them. The second one is he is here pay, payment method cash. So it's the this one here. The third star corresponds to this leaf node, and the final one corresponds to this one here. So you can describe the result of your model by a graph like this one here, or instead by using uh, the rules. The, the rules are more interpretable because they describe the what you can do if you are a female or a male, if your age are above or uh, under a certain threshold, and what is, you, is going to be your decision based on that. So this is the way how we can do the, uh, the analysis of a decision tree model. And R is pretty good to do. So um, um, I, I just, I, I only use rapid minor because we, are, we were using rapid minor before and because I, I wanted to insist also by comparing the two models. So one of the good things in rapid minor, for example, now let's change to rapid minor again, is that rapid minor is good to compare models. For example, we have done this uh, before. So I, we have just exactly uh, performed this, uh, this model here this process so we started by reading the file and then use the the operator of decision tree and then uh, we got this decision tree that let me just remind you that decision tree that we got from the rapid minor is not exactly the same uh, th that we got from from r because uh, sometimes the methods are not exactly the same and also because there are some randomness in choosing the splitting points and the variables to be splitted. So you don't have exactly the same. For example, here you have the, the split. I, I can see now that, for example, the split uh, 
of the branch for H is going to be the same. You have 30.5 of H and which corresponds to the same split that you have in R, but it's that's not necessary uh, uh, always like that. So what we are going to do now, before going to the last model, to, to, to the clustering model, uh, is to, uh, to make the evaluation uh, of the decision tree with rapid minor. So we only produce the, the plot, not the, the evaluation itself. So now you, that's what we are going to do. So I'm going to consider now the operator validation and then do more or less the same thing that we have done with the KNN. So we, I, I need to double click here in the in the in this uh, operator and open this new window with the training uh, and the testing and consider the decision tree, not the KNN now, and then the apply model and the performance. So that's what I'm going to do now. Let me go back to the to the design. So I'm going to cut, I'm going to use the same model. I'm not going to start a new one because the file is the same. Uh, but now I'm going to look for the validation. Validation. And for validation, I'm going to use this one here, the, the performance uh, classification. Oh, sorry, it's, this is not the one. Yeah, this is the split validation, I'm sorry. Performance is later on. Okay. Let me link the two procedures. Now, double click on validation. And then we have the training part and the testing part. Okay, so let's take a look at the slide so that we can follow exactly the same thing. I'm going to pick up now the decision tree. So we are going to build the model by training by using, of course, the, the, the decision tree. So decision tree is somewhere there. Here it is. Let me drag and drop it here, like that, and like that. If there is some error, it will appear and it will give you some instruction. So I think I'm following exactly the same rules link the exact notes here in the procedure. And now for the testing, uh, I'm going to apply the model and measure the performance. So apply model first. Where is it? It's not the apply forecast, it's the apply model of the scoring. It's always this one here. <clears throat> and then, so you see that there is some problem here. So maybe I hope that this is going to be uh, fixed when I add the new operator. So the last operator is going to be the performance. Yeah, now the performance is the model for the binary operator. So now this is the performance for the binary classification because you know that we have a binary uh, classifier, otherwise, we should be using another one. For example, if it was not a binary, you could use this one here. Of, or if the target variable was uh, quantitative, in that case, you should use the regression. Okay, so based on the type of the dependent variable, uh, you can choose from one of these. And of course, if, if you have a mistake, uh, Rapid Manner will let you know that you are not using the proper uh, operators. So now let me link this one here with that one. And that one here, it seems that I'm having some problems here. Yeah, because you see, I'm having a problem here because I need to link this node with that node here. So I hope that now problem is solved. Yeah, it seems that more or less it's going to be solved. I don't know if I have some parameters to see. Yeah, I have some parameters. Well, something happened here. Let me click on escape. Yeah. I have some uh, parameters to define. I can define the same parameters, the, 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 the rock curve, the precision, the recall. These are the, the, the metrics that I use to compare, you know, the training data with the test data to see in what our extent the model is good or not, and the F measure as well. I can choose the other ones as well, but. Okay, and I think that's it. Let me go back to the further uh, design. So this is the 
the model. Okay, so I need now to link this validation with the end, <clears throat> like that, and like that. As I said, if you have some questions about how to link this, you can follow my slides, or as I said, there are lots of documentation of rapid miner in Google, just Google that. And you have the third option, see some videos or just use your intuition. Sometimes it's more or less intuitive to link this. Okay, that's it. I'm going to use this split, uh, this split ratio as it is. I'm going to click on, on the model to, for it to, to run. That's it. So now you have the overall accuracy. So good, we have a higher accuracy in this in the decision. Right, this one is good. <laughs> this one is good. <laughs> Finally, we get we have a good model. Um, so this is the true positives, the true negatives, the other ones that are not good. So the accuracy is based on this uh, diagonal over the other the other values. So but, on the uh, other hand, Doctor Doctor Pedro, I have a question. Yes? Yes, please. Uh, I think I think we actually cannot compare the two uh, approaches, the decision tree and the KNN because uh, KNN we only use uh, the quantitative variable, while in this case we are using all of the variables. Well, you are completely right. That's right. We cannot. Comp we are not using the same features. Yeah. Good. Very good question. Thank you, uh, Javed. Uh, yes, um, that that was a problem. <laughs> it was my fault. Uh, the, the, yeah, here we are using the, the the old file. Yes, but in the KNN we were not using at least in R. And also, yeah, we are not using we we are, we are using different files as far as I remember. Yeah, you are completely right. So the, we, it's not comparable. So I should repeat the model now with the same files in order to see if they are comparable or not. You are you are right. Um, the curve now, it's oh, a little bit. Now I understand. Yes. Now this red one is up, up. That's right. It's up, up as it should be when the, when, when the model is good. Okay. This is the 73% of the precision, the recall, and the combined measure. This is usually what we used to, to, to use. So whenever you see a paper or a presentation in a conference using data mining algorithms, people pretty much like to use these uh, statistics and they compare algorithms based on these three measures, the precision, the recall, and the F measure. And also they uh, sometimes they use the, um, the speed of the algorithm. So, because this is a very uh, uh, important restriction, you can have very good uh, uh, measures, but if your algorithm is slower, uh, this is not good because right. it makes no sense that you can have better achievement with your results. But on the other hand, you need one day long to, to compute this. So sometimes you right. also use the time of the computation, the, computi the computation time to compare the algorithms. But, but basically, these are maybe the most important, the precision, the recall, the F measure, and also this uh, rock curve. So whenever you see a data mining paper, these are maybe the, the basic outputs for the, the measures to, to compare the, the, the performance of your, of your algorithm. So <clears throat> right. uh, now what uh, have I done uh, in the following slide before going to the clustering? I used, and as Javed said, I shouldn't be using the same file. Um, so I used, I'm not going to repeat this uh, because I, know I want to, to, to take time for the clustering part, but I use another operator that you can use in rapid manner. It's uh, compare rocks, as you can see here, compare uh, the, 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 cur the, the, the curves. Um, and then, I'm sorry, oops, then you can use, uh, if you double click and compare rocks, you can use different algorithms. So it's very good that in a row, this is something that is hard or it's not so straightforward to do in R, but in a rapid manner, you can do it like that. Just uh, put how many algorithms, uh, different algorithms you want. I only used two of them, the decision tree and can and, and then, you just run it and you can see the output. So again, uh, I don't remember if the file in this case was the same or not. Maybe maybe they were different, I'm not, I don't remember. But what you can do is that now you can, comp well, of course it was the same because I'm using the same file here. So the file needs to be the same. So now it's, it's good, this comparison. 
Now we are comparing the right things because using the same input, now you are comparing two different algorithms, the KNN and the decision tree. And you can see now, that this um, is- Now they are, they are not giving that, the one which is coming downward. No, yeah. In this case, you don't have the the, the other the other rock curve, the the, the, the threshold, which is uh, have a, a different uh, reading. But uh, for uh, simplicity, uh, now the, the rapid manner only plots the the usual rock curve, and you can see that this is the decision tree is performing better than the key and M. Yeah, much better. Much better, indeed. And then you can also compare, uh, this is going to be the exercise that I was going to propose to you, but we don't have time to that, is that not only based on the rock uh, comparison, uh, but also uh, using the other measures, the other, the other metrics, you can also uh, use, for example, the accuracy, the classification errors, the precision, the recall, and the F measure, and, and uh, compute uh, the, the differences between the two models and see in what extent one is uh, performing better than the other. And the one that is performing better in this case is going to be the decision tree. And usually, right. let me say to you that usually this is the one that performs better than KNN <laughs> is decision tree. But of course, decision tree is not the best one. If you use, for example, a random forest, I'm sure that the random forest we would perform bad, much better or uh, a neural network sometimes is better, or a SVM. And this is very easy because now you can do everything. This just add the other algorithms. You just uh, find a KNN, um, sorry, the neural network here and add the neural network or add the, um, the, uh, the, the support vector machine, the SVM algorithm here and add it and see uh, and compare the outputs and compare the rock curves. So it means that for every individual problem, for every different data set, we can uh, try all of them and whichever is the best, that's the best. If, if they that, are applicable, yes, if for they that. are applicable, of course. Uh, for, for example, uh, decision trees, uh, you have the possibility because decision, all of them are classifier. We are all only talking about supervised learning uh, algorithms. Um, and in this case, we are using uh, 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 binomial classifiers, you no know? classifiers that uh, use a, a binary classification as an output. Uh, so decision yeah. trees have this possibility as well as KNN. Uh, uh, logistic regression, uh, why not? Is th this is also something that I'm sure that you are familiar with from yes. because it comes more yes. from the statistical uh, <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> traditional, I would say, uh, part. Of, like me, I, I also come from, from statistics myself, and, and we can also compare this to logistic reg regression. I'm sure that you can find a, a logistic regression operator in rapid minor, and also neural network, and also support vector machine, but not for other, for example. There are many other algorithms that you cannot apply because they are not uh, uh, binary classifiers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's can we proceed to the last uh, yes, please, model? Yes, please. Do. Okay. Please. Thank you. So the last model is a non-supervised, is an unsupervised algorithm or unsupervised uh, machine learning uh, algorithm. It's cluster analysis. Uh, this is also maybe the, the same thing that we do in statistics. So cluster, we are also familiar with this. So uh, maybe for some of you, this is a repetition of what you know already. But let me maybe show you how uh, Rapid Miner deals with this as well as, as R, for those who don't know. So as an unsupervised algorithm now, uh, the goal of cluster analysis is not to predict or to classify. Instead, the goal, the main goal of cluster is to group uh, objects or to group individuals or observations into uh, clusters. This is a uh, what we call the, 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 the goal is to form clusters such that the inside the clusters, you can find some homogeneity and uh, outside the clusters, different elements are heterogeneous. That's, that's the idea. In other words, uh, inside each cluster uh, elements, the elements are similar and outside, or I mean, when you are comparing objects within different clusters, they are different. So this is a very good uh, and very useful algorithm, for example, in the fields of economics and in marketing, uh, we do 
we are always doing the segmentation, you know, when you are trying to um, partition the, the, your, your, your data set in, in order to find patterns in, in your data. One of the important things in cluster analysis is that, and I'm going to say this now, because sometimes I, I, I also forget to do this, is that the data must be previously normalized, uh, meaning that you should uh, compute the z-scores or just normalize, I mean, dividing, um, subtracting the mean and dividing by the, the, the um, standard, standard deviation. deviation. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, in order to avoid problems uh, with the scaling <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the units of your variables. So that's, this is a very important uh, um, um, advice that we shall never forget. There are, Plenty, I would say now, plenty of different uh, algorithms for clustering. Let me just uh, introduce some of them, like the hierarchical clustering, the non-hierarchical, and the fuzzy. There are also, for example, self-organizing maps, the expectation maximization methodologies, and so on and so forth. So there are many, many um, uh, different, uh, I would say, many different types of cluster analysis. So uh, I'm going to focus in the, in, the, in the first two methods. I'm going to give an example of a hierarchical and a non-hierarchical clustering. So basically, the, the, the difference between the, the both is that in the hierarchical clustering, the individuals are clustered from the bottom up. So we have a dissimilarity matrix, uh, and we have a, a agglomeration measure, and then uh, we will have a, a hierarchy, which is uh, usually plotted in a very useful graph that we call the dendrogram. And we also have an hierarchical. So I have a something in the chat. I don't know if, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I thought that you were, someone who was going to say something. Please interrupt me whenever you want. Um, so Actually, the non I should uh, apologize that I disturbed you. I'm no. uh, in, I'm inviting people in the chat to volunteer to do the CLI session next week to okay. practice all that we are learning right now. Thank you, thank you. I think it's a very good, very good idea, Salah. Yeah. So for non-hierarchical, we are going to use k-means, and the difference between non-hierarchical and hierarchical methods is basically this: in the non-hierarchical methods, uh, a set of uh, previously chosen nodes is uh, is defined. They are going to become the new centers of those uh, clusters, and then the existing ones are going to choose who to. Uh, to be associated with uh, using a measure of similarity. So instead of having a bottom-up approach, this is a different approach, uh, non-hierarchical one. Okay, so um, in the hierarchical, I'm going to start with the hierarchical uh, methods. Um, uh, so Leah, I, I don't know if I need to ask uh, this to the audience, but uh, I don't know how many of you are already familiar with, with clustering. Um, I, I think people need to share this. Could you unmute please. your microphones and tell us? Yeah, whether... I'm going to, sh to stop sharing. If you please just raise, you don't need to show yourself, just raise your hand in case you are familiar with hierarchical okay. clustering and also k-means. All those who are familiar, could you just raise your hand using raise... that icon? Yeah, can you or... use that? I'm or going to raise my hand. hand, for example. <laughs> Yes, uh, it is in the reactions. It is in the bottom. Yeah. If you don't know where it is, Javed Iqbal, okay, he's familiar. Uh, please, other people, if you're familiar, do it now. I think uh, not many. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to share my screen again and go back to that. Okay, thank you. I, I needed this information to be uh, to, to, to be aware of the details yes, in, my, yes, in my explanation. Yes. <laughs> so yes. for the higher, so I, I'm going to show you one of these um, method running uh, step by step uh, by hand using uh, an example, uh, using this one of these aggregation methods. So as I said, in the hierarchical uh, methodologies of the clustering analysis, you can have aggregation methods and these aggregation methods are, well, these are maybe the most common. They are the nearest neighbor, or sing, also known as single linkage, or the furthest neighbors, also known as complete linkage. And 
the, the word method. So I, I'm going to show you an example of how it works by using uh, a data matrix uh, and a distance uh, matrix. So imagine that you have this data. It's a very simple, it's, it's of course invented by me. Uh, this is not real data, only with four cases in two variables. And this is of course also invented, but it has some connection with the, with the, the, the data matrix. This is the dissimilarity matrix, or in other words, the, the, the a distance matrix, meaning that distance between two, uh, the same point is zero. Of course, the, the diagonal is zero. The distance between A and N and A is zero. We are, for example, using the Euclidean distance. Um, but the distance between different points is not zero. So uh, when I use this example, sometimes I start by asking you, uh, what do you think that are the most closest uh, points in this data matrix? Uh, this one, the ABCD one? Yes. ABCD on both sides? Yes. That you one need... or? Yeah, yeah, on both sides. So visually, I think we can look at this and see that by comparing, for example, A, that gets the value one in V1 and three in V2. Well, it, this is very different from B because B gets the value five in V1 and eight in V2. But for example, C is very similar to A, isn't it? Because can it has- you, um, I'm sorry, can you please explain to me one more time what is V1, V2? Okay, V1 and V2 are two attributes, two variables. So this and is a what, kind of a, and what is uh, what is ABCD? ABCD these are cases like individuals okay. or observations. Okay. So for okay. example, these are persons. This is one attribute like age, for example, or okay. you know income, and this is another attribute like uh, education okay. level. Okay. So it does not matter what uh, attribute you are dealing with. Uh, the only thing it's important that it's that uh, our uh, brain can easily understand that, for example, A and C are very similar because they have yes. more or less the same values for the two variables. In the same right. way that B and D, they are pretty much similar. Five, eight here for B and six and five for D. So this um, idea is more or less represented in the distance matrix. As you can see, A and C, the distance is only three. So we, I, I'm not using the Euclidean distance, but imagine that I'm using a a very similar distance. So you are comparing two points. And indeed, the smallest distance among all of these points is A and C. Uh, I'm sorry, is three corresponding to the distance between A and C. And uh, in the same way, B and D, that we already decided that they are very close, B and D, the distance is four. So the okay. most closest points here are A and C and on the other hand, B and D. Okay, so now let's see how the method works by uh, having this. Uh, so the input of the method is going to be, the input in all the methods of clustering are always the distance matrix like this one here. So we give this as an input, you see. You know, yes, um, Pedro, this thing yes. about the distance, uh, you're saying that it is some other formula uh, the, the, by which you got these numbers. Yes. Three and it, four. Yeah, okay. yeah. It, it was not, the, uh, well, the, the, the numbers have, have, have been invented by me just because this is an illustrative example. But this mm -hmm. could be, uh, this, this could be, uh, this could have been obtained by using, for example, uh, Euclidean distance. Okay. Uh, an Euclidean distance could give a very, very similar results. Okay, okay. <clears throat> okay, so now what we need to, 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 to decide is the aggregation method. So the, the, the aggregation method is method to, uh, uh, to decide something that I'm going to explain for, uh, later on. So this is the input matrix. This is the distance uh, matrix. Okay, and now we are going to um, combine the closest observations here. So we are going to cluster. The right word is to cluster. And as you remember, the most closest, most uh, similar points were A and C because their distance was the smallest one here. So right. let's do it. Mm -hmm. Let's highlight okay. AC, the distance uh, between A and C, which is the same as the uh, CNA because this is, of course, a, a symmetric uh, matrix. 
So basically what we are doing here, and what's, that's what the algorithm is going to do is to find the minimum of, of all the distances here. Right. And now we are going to combine this. So we have a new cluster. Now we have a cluster A plus C. So this is a cluster. And we still have the B and D uh, separate, of course. But what we have here now is a very important step because now we not only aggregated A and C, but also we have computed the distance between the new cluster A and C and the former elements B and D. And how do we do this? It's exactly by using this nearest neighbor or single linkage. Basically what we have done to see that the distance, for example, between the new cluster A and C and B is five, because five is the, is the smaller distance between the elements computed separately. Let me say you what I'm doing here. So basically I'm computing the distance separately between A and B and C and B, you know, because B, the distance between B, which is a cluster now, and also A and C, which is a new cluster, is basically mm -hmm. the difference, is basically the distance between them separately. I mean, A and B and C and B. And the distance between A and B is five. The distance between C and B is three. I'm sorry, and no, C and B no, is seven. Seven, seven. 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 Yeah, thank you. Yes. So the minimum between five and seven is five. So that's now, that's why we have this distance here. here. And the same applies okay. to, the, to D because I'm okay. using the nearest neighbor. I could have been using the furthest neighbor. And in that case, the distance would be seven here, not five. You okay. see? So based on this, so this uh, is another step. So we have two steps in the clustering hierarchical method. First, choose the lowest, the smallest distance between the points. And second, uh, define the new distance between the points, the points using the aggregation method. So now that we have the, uh, this matrix uh, already computed, we return to the previous step and we need to choose the closest points. Now the closest points are B and D because this is the smallest distance in this matrix here, this four. And now mm -hmm. we need to aggregate B and D, okay? That's what okay. we are going to do here. And once we have B and D and we had A and C already clustered, now we need to, to compute the distance between A plus C and B plus D. And the same applies. We need to see separately the distance between A and B and A and D and C and B and C and D. And the smallest distance, if you take some time to, to, to look at that, is going to be five. So it means that now we reach a, a, an end, we reach to, to an end because there is no more anything else to aggregate. We started with four points, then mm -hmm. lowered the dimension to three, then to two, and of course the the, the latest the the, the 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 last we got is going to be just one. So based on this, let me show you a graphical representation of what we can do in hierarchical clusters, which is the dendrogram. So for some of you that are already familiar with the dendrogram, the dendrogram just shows this uh, you know bottom up approach of uh, of aggregation. As you remember, we aggregate first. A and C that had a distance of three between them. And also we aggregate the, the B and D that had a distance of four. Remember, three and four. Right. That, that's mm -hmm. what we have here. And finally, mm -hmm. both of them have a distance of five. So it's perfect that now we can see completely, uh, I would say clearly that uh, we have here our aggregation method and you can see that now we can decide how many clusters we have because for this, uh, the only goal that we have by doing this dendrogram is to have a, a picture of the, how many, how do data cluster, you know, cluster uh, uh, into groups. We have four elements. Now they are clustered into, in my opinion, there are two groups, but we can also consider that there are three or four, of course, but four, it makes no sense because four, you return to the previous <laughs> data. And uh, I think we have two groups here. Uh, a plus C and B plus D. Okay, so there are other methods like the ward. I'm not going to wait for the detail. I think that we don't have my, pretty much time to, 
to go on detail. So let me uh, go a little bit and now explain uh, very, very quickly the K-means methodology, which is a different one. Uh, for example, in, in, um, in, um, in the K-means, you select the K points as the initial centroids, and then you repeat until the minimum, uh, like a stopping criteria that you have. You, have, you are going to form clusters and recalculate the center of each cluster. So as I said before, this is not a bottom-up approach. This is a different, completely different approach. And for that purpose, I'm going to show you, I think this is very helpful, um, an illustrative example. Imagine that you have these points here. The only difference, or I would say the main difference between k-means and the hierarchical clustering is that in the k-means, you need to define how many clusters you need in advance. That is something that we didn't uh, do in the clustering, in the, in, the, in, the, in the hierarchical. We just formed two clusters, I would say, naturally. Uh, you know, It was a little bit natural that they, they were, but here, Looking at this picture, I, I just can I, I just don't know. So let me, for example, imagine that we are going to have uh, four. So if I have four groups, what the method is going to do is going to look for randomly four different points here, and then you know you see what is happening. It just picks up the most closest points and then repeats again by recomputing the center of the groups that, that are already formed, the formed until reaching it to an end. And in this case, I didn't change anything. The dot, uh, the black dots were, uh, are exactly in the same position that they were before. But now you can see that we have four different groups. Let me do it again. Now with different points. Now the four points that are always randomly uh, chosen are these four points here. Now, what is going to happen is going to, each of them is going to choose the nearest point. This one is completely alone because that has no close, closest friends. And so now by repeating this procedure in choosing the closest inside the group, all the points that have been chosen are being adapted and, and moving closest to the center. Or the, the, the center is going to be uh, to, move, to move, not the points themselves. And in this case, very, we have this solution. Uh, very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, this is a different perspective. So let me go back to the to the k-means. So and now to finish, how can we do this in R and in a, a rapid minor? So in R, this is very very easy. You just need to to scale. So this scale is the common to normalize the data. You need to compute the distance. Okay, uh, and and see this. So. Uh, I, I can do it now in, in our studio. It's it's very easy. Um, I have the the file already here, so let me um, run this. Oh, it's not um, it's not imported, but I can do it uh, very very fast if you don't mind. It's fine, no problem. No problem. We can have uh, have a few minutes more. Okay. So I'm going to, oops, it was very fast. It was not this one. <laughs> it was very fast. <clears throat> uh, I need to repeat this. Oh, I think I'm having some problems with my mouse, maybe. Okay, I think problem has been solved. So this is a churn. Maybe I'm going to use the complete file. Okay. So this is the way I I import data to to R. So now it's correct. Now following my code, uh, I'm going to run it like that. Oh, the cluster was was already there, wasn't that? Sorry. I need the third attempt. I don't know what happened with my file. Churn, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. In my example, this is not the file. That's why it was not running. <laughs> this is a different file. 
for this example, I'm using a different file. Yeah, it has to do with the, the uh, this, this is another problem I forgot to, to, to mention that in this case, uh, the, this, the difference between the quantitative attributes and uh, the categorical is, is, is very important, you know? So um, we need to be aware of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm going to use a different, a different, uh, I'm going to use this one here, cluster. Okay, so this uh, file has to do with the uh, jobs, as you can see. And for each job, yeah, I'm using this one instead because it has more quantitative verbs. So I'm not going to use the churn anymore. Um, and it's, as I said, it's important to have the notion that when you do clustering, you need to be aware of the distance measure. For, for example, if you are doing, if you are using the Euclidean distance, this, you know that the Euclidean distance is suitable uh, for uh, uh, quantitative variables. But if you are going to use uh, uh, nominal or categorical variables or ordinal variables instead, you should not be using uh, uh, the, 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 the Euclidean distance, but there are, there are other distances that, 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 that you can use. And there is also the possibility of mixing variables, you know, having categoric, both categorical and quantitative variables. In that case, there are mixed distances. But this is a different field. I know many statisticians that don't, don't like this kind of, you know, combined measures. So I'm going to be a little bit more pure in this case. I'm going only to use uh, in this example only the, uh, the same distance for everyone. So that's why I'm using uh, um, the Euclidean distance in this case. So, OK. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> let me go back to the, to the code. Uh, but now I need to to see the other code. I don't know where it is. I think I need. Yeah, now I I'm there. I think. Okay. Here I am. So now I'm going to normalize the data. That's what I have done already. I need to take uh, the nominal variable that contains the jobs part. So I'm going to take the first column out and now compute the distance by using the Euclidean distance, okay? Now I'm going to use the hclust uh, function to perform the hierarchical clustering using the word method. I could be using another method. That's it. And now the dendrogram. So it's very, very fast. Now you can see the dendrogram for this case of the job. So it's classified, it's clustering the jobs based, based on the education level, the income, the suicide, suicide rate, and another variable. So that's what it's we're doing. Um, very fast, I must say. Very fast but, in this case. But then again, uh, how do you interpret it is it not very yeah. complicated oh, of course of course now let me show you it again so it now uh, it's up to us to decide how many clusters we need for example you i think that again a solution of four clusters or two is maybe too too small to a uh, small number of clusters if i take five this these were going to be the clusters and well that's it now i have to look at the job number 10 11 1 4 and 5 they should be uh, together I don't know to what job this corresponds, but that's the idea. This, this is another group. This is another group. You know, we have five pluses overall. And to make a proper interpretation, yeah, to make a proper interpretation, I'm going to perform the other, the other uh, steps until, until this. So let me show you this list here. So these are the five groups that I found. And these are the score, you know, taking into account the original variables, prestige of the job, the suicide rate, the income, and the education level. So now, based on this, we can describe clusters. For example, what I can see here is that the cluster with the higher suicide rate is the three, cluster number three here, which is also one with a very high income, uh, mm -hmm. but with a low educational, you see? So it's 
in a certain way you can describe your cluster and also using the information of the jobs that are in that cluster you can have the notion of how it is being clustered for example the cluster number two as you can see is the cluster with a very high with, with the higher with the highest income the, the the income compared to the other cluster with the other mm -hmm. clusters is six thousand and something so mm -hmm. maybe it's related to i don't know very uh, high uh, uh rated uh we in, and also with high prestige as you can see i, I don't know what uh, jobs corresponds to this maybe you, we could go there and, and just see because you can, in all the uh, all the the groups now are, for example, if I take this here, for the, this is the group number two. So if I write half here, I can see. I think I'm having a problem with my. It's not running. I don't know why. Okay. Oops, I'm having a problem with my computer now. <laughs> Uh -uh. Okay, but I, I was uh, my enter key is, <laughs> is having a problem. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, but but I was going to show you the the because it's possible to see what job corresponds to what cluster. So I'm not going to maybe to 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 take more more time. So this is what you can see can do in the uh, in the hierarchical clustering, and also that's what you we got. That's how we describe the clusters and now ah okay for a last um sorry about my dog uh, for the you could also look at the elbow rule so the i have the code for that so the elbow rule is something that you can uh, do here i have the code for that where you can for example compute this chart which is very useful to see how many clusters you should have so based on the within groups uh, sum of squares, the lowest, the better. For example, we could have four. Uh, we call it the elbow rule because this seems like an arm. You know, the elbow should be more or less here. So this corresponds to the lowest point. So maybe four would be the four or five would be the 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 best. So I think I'm reaching to an end now. The cluster analysis can also be performed in in rapid minor. And um, that's but the, uh, we we won't have time for that because it's yeah. already five yeah. minutes past. Seven. But you have the slides here. You know, have also ways to interpret the clusters here. So this graph is very good for you to see how, for example, the clusters are different according to the variables, and uh, and that's it. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pedro Campos. We're extremely grateful to you. Uh, I would You're now welcome. like to uh, request um, Professor Muhammad Aslam, who is the senior uh, member of the PyStar team, to say a few words of appreciation. Okay, without going into the formal terminology and formal language, on behalf of PyStar and all the participants, I very highly appreciate and thank for all the time and the effort spent by you, Mr. Dr. Pedro Campos, uh, for selecting the material and uh, examples for the workshop and making slides so nicely. This presentation was very simple and easy for the participants to understand. Doing examples by means of rapid minor was very interesting. We also appreciate the sharing of the link for the workshop material, which is uh, uh, available to the participants. Thank you very much also for taking out uh, uh, taking up uh, uh, our uh, emails for the uh, for answering the queries that came up during the CLI sessions. Thank you very much, and looking forward to see you in the workshop three. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very, thank much. You very much. Thank you, and I would like to also uh, share. 
my second last slide. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will be meeting for the third and last workshop on the 20th of February, and this time it will be not 2.15, but 2.30, according to the time change, uh, the prayer timing changes with the movement of the sun. So, uh, Pedro, if that's okay, we will have it from 2.30 to 5.30 yes, p.m. Of course, Pakistan yeah. time. Okay, now once again, please, I request everybody to open your cameras so that we can have a group photo. And after which, of course, I thank everybody. So I stop sharing the screen again. And please do open your cameras so that we can have a group photo. Uh, and uh, I also want to give you the great news that although Thomas had to leave a little early, he said to me in a, uh, in a message that if nobody else has volunteered to do the CLI session next time, then uh, I can do it again because it will give me an opportunity to learn uh, this thing better. So I really want to commend him for that. And uh, uh, the rest of you also, you know, now you need to <laughs> need to stop being shy and uh, to next time, whenever we ask you, I, I would like to have more volunteers to do the CLI, CLI session the collaborative learning. And you know, you can do it together also. So Ali Raza, you're already working with him and me and Javad and Dr. Noor and Dr. Sharka on this uh, research project that we're doing. So why don't you also join him for the for this particular CLI session? Because you, Ali Raza, also did the four workshops on machine learning uh, about a year ago with uh, Dr. Raza. So I'm sure you understood a lot of what Dr. Pedro was saying today. And so I would like to request you to consider joining uh, to Dr. Thomas uh, to do the next CLI session. So the CLI session, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, going to happen next Sunday, as I wrote in the chat at, uh, I think I wrote, uh, what did I write? 2 to 3.30, I think. So we can practice then a lot of what Dr. Pedro has uh, shared with us today. And uh, Pedro, uh, again, uh, it's as simple as this, that uh, you don't know that we can actually don't have words enough to thank you. Uh, it was my so pleasure, much Saya. Thank you all <laughs> for, for attending. Thank you. And so much, so much of this is not really not known so much uh, in the statistics community. So that is why. Thanks a lot from my side also, Dr. Pedro. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we did not have the time for the feedback, uh, but uh, I think next time, everybody, let's just say it now that we will have 15, 20, 30 minutes more so that we can also give in the last workshop. All of you can verbally also express uh, whatever you, you, you felt. Okay, thank you very much. And bye bye and Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Thank you. Allah. Hafiz. God, God bless you all.